can keep things on task. I'm sure Alan will pop in here. Um, but uh, Heather, if you could start by, um, I guess we'll do a call call to order and uh, and um, sure. you know just remind folks that it it would be uh, wonderful if we could uh, end by nine o'clock um, and kick things off uh, right in 2022. And uh, with that, we will go ahead and do a, a roll call. Uh, Heather, could you call the roll? Sure. And then I would also like to ask people just to introduce yourselves slight, you know, just a little bit. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, because we do have our new member, Council Member Lisa Dish. Um, so who you are, um, where you're at, that's part of roll call, where you're um, calling in from in terms of jurisdiction, and then maybe a little bit of trivia, something about yourself. So we can start with, oh, Stephen is gone. Jennifer Cornell. Hi, everyone. Um, present, Jennifer Cornell. I'm here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, I am Senior Vice President of Marketing, Communications, and Events for a local nonprofit, um, Ann Arbor Spark. And um, I have four kids, two cats, and one dog. A little <laughs> bit of trivia and a little bit about myself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Alan Haber, he's not here yet, um, but I'm sure he'll be joining a little later. Sarah Hammerschmidt. Here in Ann Arbor, I can't, I'm Elisa and I know each other and I can't think of anything interesting about myself. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people like, I have twins, but she knows that. Oh. Um, I don't know. I grew up in Michigan and left for 17 years before I came back to raise my family in Ann Arbor. Oh, you didn't know that? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, oh, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Jeff for Henny. Oh, hi, I'm, I'm Jeff Henny from Ann Arbor, present. Uh, I have uh, three kids and uh, four grandkids, and uh, I'm a professor at Cleary University, and I used to be a director of technology, trans me biomedical technology transfer at the University of Michigan. All right, uh, Camilla. Hi, present in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I am a second year urban planning grad student at U of M and I have one cat. You're on the home stretch, right? The semester? Yeah, I graduated in May. Oh, congratulations. Very exciting. Thank you. Uh, Rita Mitchell. Hi, I'm Rita Mitchell. I'm here in Ann Arbor and um, I have a long history as being a cross country skier. So I attempt to be tolerant of cold and I have two cats. Alice Ralph. Alice Ralph, attending from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Washington County, Michigan. Um, since we're talking about weather and geography, I uh, grew up mostly in Oklahoma and uh, went to college in Wisconsin and thought I was going to freeze to death in my freshman year. Finally realized that you don't buy your Wisconsin winter coat in Oklahoma. <laughs> so I came back for winter term and got myself a Wisconsin coat and had my skates, uh, my ice skates sent from Oklahoma, which had been on the shelf for probably eight years <laughs> because not much ice skating in Oklahoma and uh, survived. And then I uh, uh, became a college textbook publishing rep um, and traveled most of the wood. Uh, well, the upper Midwest um, as a representative for a college textbook company, now not known because it everything got collapsed in that industry. Went back to school, became an architect, and have been in Ann Arbor uh, since 1976. So, uh, been involved with the tree line and other civic and civic activities. Great, thank you. Frank Wilhelm. Hi, I've been in Ann Arbor since uh, I think 1968. I went to school at Eastern and uh, back then you could travel west on Washtenaw, leave Ypsilanti, go into the country and then begin to enter, enter Ann Arbor. Um, that's no longer possible. I, I went from Eastern to becoming a high school history teacher and geography teacher at Dexter High School. Um, I mean, joined staying in touch because of Facebook and so on uh, with a number of my former students or, who are entering the, their 
their eighth decade of life. <laughs> I'm barely ahead of them in age. Um, and I uh, segued, it's a whole story, which I won't give you, I segued from teaching to becoming uh, the, the executive director of the Historical Society of Michigan for eight years, and then uh, transitioned to what is now the Ross School of Business in 1980, and spent 30 years there uh, as assistant, well, eventually, I had many titles, uh, assistant dean and, uh, for development and alumni relations, retired 12 years ago. Thank you, Frank. I mean, in Ar I mean, Ann Arbor, in the fifth ward. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Adam? Uh, Adam Zemke, you're in Ann Arbor. Um, uh, let's see here. I will join the uh, uh, Camilla with the, the one cat club. Um, she, although I'm definitely confident that she has us, not uh, the other way around. <laughs> um, and... Uh, but, um, but uh, you know, grew up here in Ann Arbor, um, uh, been involved in politics for about a decade uh, and, um, you know, care about uh, seeing this project come to fruition. Um, and outside of that, uh, my day job, I have a couple of day jobs. I um, run a, uh, a education policy coalition called Launch Michigan that uh, is uh, comprised of uh, business educators, and uh, philanthropists focused on uh, improving equity in public education. And then uh, a few years ago, I got the uh, bright idea, maybe bright idea of uh, getting involved in the uh, multimodal transportation business and founded a, a scooter uh, moped store here in Ann Arbor. And that's been a fun adventure, um, definitely an adventure uh, at some time. And, uh, but, um, you know, just pleased to be here and involved in the community. Great. All right, Councilmember Briggs. I assume you two know each other, but feel free to share a bit of trivia for the rest of us. Heather, fairly well. <laughs> next year. Yeah, so um, Erica Briggs here in Ann Arbor. Um, let's see, some trivia that might be new to all of you. Um, I My more exotic travels occurred when I was, before the age of five, I lived in Morocco and Kuwait, um, and if we want to talk about cold spots, Morocco was one of them. Our family moved because we didn't have heat in the house, <laughs> so we came back to, came back to Indiana, moved to, moved to Morocco, or moved to Kuwait, um, and then slightly different climate, and then ended up here in Ann Arbor, where my dad was pursuing a PhD when I was five. And Council Member Dish. There we go. My unmute just wouldn't work. Um, so I am the representative for Ward 1 in Ann Arbor. I'm also a political science professor at the University of Michigan, which is a job that I just adore as much as I am enjoying council as well. Um, and I'm teaching a class this semester on uh, really democratic politics. And we are going to read a bunch of cool stuff some of it by dead people, but some of it by live people. And then we are going to culminate in doing a case, two case studies, one on the Flint water crisis and one on the Great Lakes Water Compact diversion decision for Waukesha, Wisconsin. And you would think that one is an example of government failing and the other is an example of uh, you know, a smart, sustainable compact succeeding. But I would argue that the Flint crisis was a better success for democratic politics, given what the citizens were able to accomplish, than the Waukesha diversion, which should not have happened and will enable sprawl and enables suburbs that prevent multifamily housing from being built in them. It provides them with water from my lake. So I am, um, and I hope the students come out perfectly indoctrinated. <laughs> <laughs> Great work. And here's Alan Haber. Alan, we're just going around doing introductions since we have a new member. Uh, you're the last one, so if you Thank you. Don't I, mind. Had, I had my usual trouble getting through the Zoom, and Rita is my savior. And thank you, Rita, for sending me again the link. I'm Alan Haber. I'm in Ann Arbor. And uh, hello, Lisa. Hello, everyone. Uh, 
I am intimately connected with this project since 2009 when I first spoke that the center of the city should be developed as a community commons uh, fostering a culture of peace and nonviolence for the children of the world. And bit by bit, we're getting there. So I um, look forward to this meeting. Heather, you're up last. Oh, me. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I'm Heather Seiferth. I'm a planner uh, in the systems planning division at the city, so which is different than the planning department. Um, my focus is on community engagement, um, but I do specialty projects like this, like uh, the tree line, as well as um, you know, center of the city and other random projects I get pulled into to do project management for. Um, my background is actually collaboration and planning. The first uh, big job that I had um, out of school was working for an agency and helping jurisdictions get along with each other. So township cities and villages get over past disputes and work on whatever planning project that they wanted to do. And so I traveled around the state doing that. Um, and then since then I've done work with clean energy. Um, I worked in the private sector for a little bit and then um, here I am at the city working on a variety of things. Well, I could say just a little bit more because I was really brief. I see these are wider introductions. Uh, I've been a, uh, I began the University of Michigan in 1954 and became a political activist in that first year, which I have been uh, ever since uh, initiating the uh, group called the Students for a Democratic Society in 1959. I was part of the war on poverty when I went to the School of Social Work and got grant for the University of Michigan and worked in the Willow Village area around the old bomber factory. I've lived in California. I lived in California for 25 years after I spent a year at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. And I'm particularly, I, when I read Peter Leinbaugh's writing on the commons, I began to see the commons as really the critical question in so many movements and struggles all around the world is the enclosure of commonly pooled resources or the commonwealth by corporations or the government is really the struggle. And here we have an opportunity to provide a, a model for the self-management of the resources, both a bit of land and also the talent of the community. So this is a long uh, development for me, and and I hope um, I was part of the uh, center of the city task force. And while at the beginning people were very hesitant to this idea, by the end there was a, an educational process, and people saw this commons was really something to it. And I hope that all of us here will see similarly that this is a profound idea of how resources are managed more than just what is the, uh, where there are benches and stages and things like that. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. I also just noticed that I um, had paused the recording for the Zoom. This is actually being recorded um, by CTN and being aired live by CTN, so it is being recorded. I do a Zoom recording as a backup, so I'm gonna resume that. Recording in progress. All right, there we go. All right. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone. Welcome council member Dish. It's wonderful to have another council member here. So um, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and, and uh, start with the approval of the agenda. Um, any amendments to the agenda this evening? All right, can we get a motion to approve them? Motion. Any second? Second. All right, uh, all in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Um, <clears throat> we'll go into the approval of the minutes from uh, the last time Heather uh, had posted those on uh, Let Star for us. Any uh, questions regarding the minutes from uh, last, I guess the last meeting of last year? Can we get a motion to approve? So moved by Councilman Briggs, any uh, second? All right, by Jen. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, and uh, we'll go into public comment. Uh, Heather, do we have any members of the public 
Joining we do. Us. We have three people that joined us tonight, and one person has their hand up. So I will, um, it's the person with the phone number ending in 326. I'm allowing you to talk. Welcome. Welcome. You should be able to speak now. Again, that's the person with. There you go. Hello. Hello. Can you uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Hi, this is uh, <laughs> Jeff Crockett calling. And I, some of you, first of all, I want to thank Lisa for, as a <laughs> first ward constituent, I'm very pleased that Lisa has joined this committee. I've already talked to her about the commons and the garden, but I'm speaking tonight. Oh, just, just a brief word about myself for the people who don't know me. I recently concluded a 47 year career in education. My focus was on assistive technology. Uh, my real interest though was in developing educational communities and uh, community uh, and educational community engagement. So when I retired, uh, getting I started getting to the commons and I thought, wow, this is just a natural fit. I just sort of love this. <laughs> so uh, some of you already know that uh, I was involved in starting a community garden. We called ourselves the Green Team with about 25 people. We spent the summer building this garden. Many of you have probably seen it. <clears throat> Uh, but in the process of that, I realized it was important to collect data and to create a presentation. So I created a PowerPoint presentation, which I previously distributed to you all. Uh, and I realized that uh, the importance of uh, PowerPoint, because seeing is believing, text just doesn't really do it. You have to see to understand really what is going on. So at the conclusion of the growing season, I connected with Alan and Odile Haver, realizing that the best way to chronicle the activity of the, the commons as a whole was through a PowerPoint presentation. So I believe Alan through Heather probably communicated or passed along a 53 slide presentation. I hope you have an opportunity to look at that if you haven't already. Probably the most important slide on that presentation is number four, which has to do with the contributors. And you'll see uh, a wide range of contributors. We had probably close to 30 individuals who at various points got involved in the garden, but not only that, <clears throat> in the planning of the various events. We documented 450 hours just in the garden alone. I would estimate that we at least spent 200 more volunteer hours in developing these five events, uh, which, uh, I felt were very successful, but we took pictures just to show you what it was like. And there's a difference between describing it and being there and sort of seeing it. So I hope you sort of take <laughs> a close look. Uh, one of the things I want to point out with uh, what I realized uh, through the activation of the uh, comments was how much local businesses you know, can benefit. So for example, we had Jerusalem Garden, Graffactory Printing, Linden Wand Photography, Big City Small World Bakery, Tree Town Murals, uh, B Square Design Studios, A2 Scooter, Hanker Jewel, Holidays Restaurant, Argus Farm Stop, and Margolis Nursery not only uh, participated, but we advertised and promoted them. And this is sort of following the lead of what Plymouth has done with their Kellogg. Uh, commons because uh, they regularly promote local businesses and this is a real strong incentive for us to activate the garden but beyond the promotion of local businesses we learned that you can do a whole bunch of different activities including fundraising demonstrations supporting nonprofits interestingly enough painting uh, <coughs> uh, chalk drawing entertainment the open mic was particularly interesting because in this age of social media where a lot of people go and participate, this provides an opportunity for people who aren't on social media to engage and speak their minds uh, to other people. Um, and community discussions, uh, all of which, by the way, are on a space which is handicapped accessible and you don't have to shut down streets 
when you have uh, events on the commons like you do in other places. You can have events on the commons and keep the city streets running. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that there's a great website um, that it's about uh, public, it's um, a project for public spaces. And if you Google that, you will get to the website. And this is a nonprofit group which has explored developing public spaces for many, many years. And they've listed uh, this one document, 11 principles for creating community places. And I would like to highlight number six, which is start with the petunias, lighter, quicker, cheaper. The complexity of public spaces is such that you cannot expect to do everything right initially. The best spaces experiment with short-term improvements that can be tested and refined over many years. Elements such as seating, outdoor cafes, public art, striping of crosswalk, crosswalks, and pedestrian havens, community gardens and murals are examples of improvement that can be accomplished in a very short time. And I would appreciate if you could keep that in mind as you look in the next steps, certainly go for the request for information, but you can certainly check this document out for a lot of other wonderful ideas on how to get started. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jeff. All right, and our next person is Robert Black. And um, I forgot to start timing, but we do need to remember that comments need to be kept to three minutes. So Robert, here we go. You should be able to talk. I have it, Heather, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, hello again and happy 2022. We look forward to new goals and actions this year for Ann Arbor Central Park and Civic Center Commons. I'd like to address agenda item number eight tonight, design process draft RFI review. This version two is a good progress from your previous version one, a key change being where you highlight all the land parcels noted in Proposition A, Liberty Plaza, Surface of Library Lane Parking Structure, Library Lane, and Kemp House. <clears throat> I also applaud the reference and link to the Center of the City Task Force report. I suggest here, however, that there is more work to do in researching this report and harvesting the most important takeaways from that report. This important groundwork will aid professionals in tailoring their responses to the RFI and may also prove to be a more efficient use of limited public and private funds. The last paragraph of Section 1 History references the fifth recommendation of the task force. Authorize initial planning for the development of the public spaces on the center of the city block. This is an important step. Yet the task force noted necessary priorities before goal number five. For example, goal number two, schedule regular meetings of a center of the city block partners group. This is an important step and can be done informally at first to build awareness and assess potential interest in the immediate neighbors of the block. I'm glad to see that your agenda item 7B this evening, we'll talk about that. Goal number three, approve ground level parking on the library lot structure and begin efforts to redesign as an active public space. The first part of this goal is already being addressed. The second part, the activating part, has been inspiringly done through the past year, as you just heard from my colleague, Jeff Crockett, by the committed volunteers of the initiating committee working in collaboration with your efforts. The recent PowerPoint, as Jeff described, shows the many successful events this group did to activate the commons in 2021. And goal number four, authorize initial planning of the long-term development of the center of the city block as a priority under the city's master plan. This goal is paramount to the foundation of a complete RFI, work that would pay dividends in soliciting potential professionals and could be accomplished in one or more facilitated working sessions that would knit together the current thinking on critical planning elements, such as Ann Arbor's comprehensive plan, the Ann Arbor Sustainability Framework Plan, A20, and much more. This need not be a daunting task, for each of you are guided by a shared desire to create a Central Park and Civic Center Commons for Ann Arbor, a vision that is forming into a more defined reality at each of your successive meetings. You would not be here if you didn't have such a commitment. Thank you for this and have a productive meeting tonight. Thank All right, you, thank Bob. you, Robert. Oh, and Mr. Dahoney is here, so let's welcome him coming in now and I see one other person um, 
who has called in but has not raised their hand. So if you would like to raise your hand and speak, please go ahead and do that. And welcome, Mr. Dahoney. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, I think that's it for public comment. All right. Um, <clears throat> In that case, we'll move on to member news and updates. Uh, I think, Alan, you uh, had uh, some information you wanted to share here. Yeah, well, I have several. I do, I was part, part of putting together this uh, um, PowerPoint on the history of what the initiating committee has done in the course of the year. And I do hope you'll give it all a good read. Um, I uh, in the uh, slide 20 and 41, uh, we had participation from Native American uh, people and have developed the sense beyond the land acknowledgement that we generally give in any public program, recognizing that uh, before ourselves and uh, our antecedents here, this land was uh, occupied by the Potawatomi people who were displaced in the 1820s and are forced military march away. And so the idea is uh, percolating to see how the Ann Arbor community could extend a invitation to return, that there be established uh, a a community from the uh, Potawatomi people here in Ann Arbor, particularly besides just the justice of the matter, that the uh, indigenous cultures have a great sense of how the commons actually works, and even more import importantly, have a cultural experience of sustainability and resilience in terms of uh, cultural and environmental stress. And that is something that we and everyone needs to deal with. So I make that announcement that these conversations are going on between ourselves and people of the original people here. And anyone interested in participating in that development, I do hope you'll be in touch with me. And um, I'm hoping that we will have some uh, gathering for Martin Luther King Day on uh, Monday the 17th, later in the afternoon. There are lots of things going on, but it's very important in some sense that this uh, center of the city be a place for the important holidays and uh, 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 celebrations and consciousness raising events have their location, yes, in the center of the city. So I think that's what was on my mind. And I did send forward a number of uh, edits toward the uh, request for information that uh, I wasn't uh, actually I so you uh, they will come up as they come up okay any questions at all for Alan <laughs> all right thank you Alan um, and you obviously did attend or send uh, that document as well um, I started looking through it, but I haven't finished yet. So um, well, it'll, it'll come at agenda at agenda time. Absolutely. So uh, we'll move on to the working group updates then. Um, first one up is the comparable communities, and I know that we had some discussion uh, before uh, before the uh, Christmas holiday, at least. And I don't know, Frank or Rita or uh, Sarah would like to talk a little bit about. Um, the latest. Uh, I can also add some things as well, but I uh, I was not uh, uh, in attendance on the visit, um, and uh, so I wanted to see if there's anybody else wanted to wanted to comment. Um, I guess I have a question whether whether we're going to take a quick look at our uh, field report from the Detroit visit, and uh, and uh, I think myself and, and Rita and Alice can all. Uh, uh, comment about this, but we've I think we've established a, a very uh, rich uh, 
connection with the, the Detroit, the downtown Detroit partnership. This is a hundred year old business uh, organization that has partnered with the city and uh, they really manage and, and, uh, and help with the design and development and improvement of uh, a number of downtown Detroit parks. And uh, on the 10th of December, we were blessed with a, a pretty nice day in Detroit and uh, Alice Ralph, uh, Rena Mitchell and myself were able to make the trip and to walk uh, and visit uh, five separate uh, downtown parks. And um, I, I guess we'll just, um, it, it, well, there was one thing that struck me as we got on the ground there that um, a number of these parks, uh, although they show up on Augustus Woodward's 1805 plan after the, the devastating fire that destroyed most of Detroit, we got ahead of Chicago with our fire. Um, and uh, a whole new plan was developed. Um, and these plots of land were there in the, the, the early design, but they, in the early 20th century, they, they got co-opted by motorized transportation and they became uh, uh, public transit uh, transfer points. Uh, and so the, it's only in the last uh, 15 to 20 years that a number of these parks have been reclaimed as open spaces uh, in Detroit. Um, if you could scroll a bit, uh, uh, this is a, a picture of Grand Circus Park, which is the largest of the parks by far uh, that we visited. Um, and it uh, is probably the most uh, passive of, of parks. Uh, it doesn't have uh, standing regular daily activities that we're aware of, but they, it, it is close to important public venues like Comerica Park and uh, the Orchestra Hall and, and uh, not really too far from uh, Ford Field either. So it, it, it does serve as a venue uh, for opening days and, and uh, for baseball, et cetera. Um, and, the, and I just want to point out one part of yeah. it that the that semi that circle that we're looking at there is actually an elevated space and it's really easy to sit on it. It's like an incorporated bench, which is pretty nice. Right. Um, and this you don't you can't really tell, but there's a little dog park there as well. That's right on the left, I believe. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, 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 ahead, am I am I correct that this is the one that's on top of the parking? Yeah, that's store? right. <laughs> we meant we don't want to leave that out. That's right. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> yes. um, and so look at look at those trees. The the park predated the underground parking and then was put back together after the underground structure was placed there in the, I think it initially in the 1950s. Um, so it, uh, but it's a good example for us to study and understand. Um, I think we can move on to Capitol Park, I believe is next. Um, this by far is the smallest park we visited. Uh, it's about, I believe this is about a half, a, half an acre. Um, and again, it was, uh, well, it, it, its history is that, that the first state capital of the territory of Michigan and in the first very first years of statehood um, was uh, on this site. The building was destroyed by fire, um, but it's also the burial ground of our first governor, uh, Stephen T. Mason, who was, uh, became governor of the territory at the age of 23 or something like that. It was unbelievable. Um, but it, uh, this was redeveloped uh, with a, a funding of 1.1 million from the Detroit uh, downtown Development Authority uh, in uh, the early 2000s and has really been a spark to rejuvenate the adjoining uh, neighborhood. Uh, it's very enclosed uh, with, uh, you know, relatively tall buildings just really adjacent, as you can see here. Um, and those poles there are permanently placed uh, umbrellas to protect against the weather uh, and uh, I think we are all kind of envious of that. Wonder how we could do that at, uh, on the library lot. Um, so there, there are activities there. Um, maybe moving on to Campus Martius, the it's kind of the this is in some ways the jewel of uh, the downtown parks. It's quite small, 1.2 acres. Um, these smaller parks are really comparable in many ways to the size of the 
top of the library lot. Um, it has a full, not, not a full size uh, ice rink, but one that's larger than Grand, uh, than uh, Rockefeller Center, they're proud to say. Um, and there's a Four Seasons restaurant on the site and uh, major events. Uh, for example, you can see the, uh, the Christmas tree in the background here, uh, which attracts, uh, they, they say 75 to 100,000 people for the lighting of that tree. So this is a real hub of activity uh, in, the, in the downtown. I, I'd and, like to mention also that, that uh, there is an in-ground uh, performance platform that uh, is integrated with the sidewalk around the skating rink. And it, it can be elevated uh, as a performance space. And right. Yeah, there, 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 a lot of flexibility. I, I've been on this site when it's just um, pre-pandemic, I guess, uh, um, just shoulder to shoulder with uh, people involved in multiple activities, uh, including the ice rink and so on. Uh, immediately adjacent to it is Cadillac Square Park. I mean, you, you don't really realize you're uh, leaving one and entering another. Uh, Cadillac Square Park is, I think I'm right, 360 feet long and only 60 feet wide. There's mm -hmm. basically a corridor uh, with small but uh, effectively used uh, uh, portable buildings, which are removed in the summer, but uh, they are, uh, they house a uh, small startup business. And so, Jen, I thought about you immediately that, uh, gee, we could have some, uh, um, some business startups right here on uh, uh, the center of the city. Um, and then there's this large, it's called C Cadillac Lodge, this large indoor space uh, that hosts uh, a variety of activities. Uh, I didn't actually get in there, but uh, I think... Uh, did, did it Rita, was cozy. Was it was it's giant and cozy at the same time. It has multiple seating areas with big comfy chairs. It was heated. There's a coffee bar here. There's some other food in the back. And this was a huge tent. Just hey, huge. Frank. Hey, Frank, can I jump in for a second too? Yeah. Like I know, I know that there are businesses, um, retail businesses in town who have actually gone to the pop-ups for oh. Campus Martius. So oh. local businesses. So um, Rock, paper, scissors, for instance, like I know that they have done a pop up in Campus Martius. Oh, um, wow. oh, and so I think that, that we could even draw from the local business community to to source some, you know, best practices or whatever to activate the space in that way. So thanks for letting me add that. Yeah, that, that'd be a, a great way to keep uh, the space active in, in, the, in the winter months, I guess. I mean, maybe more than that. But I think these are brought in. You know, like in November and taken out in in uh, you know early spring, uh, and then brought in, and then brought back uh, the following year. At least that's their their method of, of operating. Yeah, I I I think Jen makes a good point. These are more likely, uh, more aptly described as pop ups rather than startups. Right. Yeah, thank you. That's good. It could be both actually. Sure. <laughs> um. And then finally, uh, Beacon Park, uh, sorry for the page separation there. Uh, th this is different because uh, DTE Energy uh, started this park on their, on their property and it's uh, managed by the Detroit, the Downtown Detroit Partnership, David Cowan's group. Um, and it's, uh, it's, very open and airy, but uh, there is also an in indoor facility for the winter months. Uh, a lot of activity, uh, much of it uh, directed towards children. Uh, there is a, a Four Seasons uh, uh, two-story restaurant on the site, which we don't have pictured here. It's in kind of in back of that where that person is standing taking that picture, and that's the temporary. In well, maybe it's permanent. They, I think they bring up pull up the sides uh, in better weather. Maybe that is a permanent mm -hmm. structure, I, I don't recall. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it is. I've been there at multiple points throughout. Oh, okay, the yeah, yeah. It looks Quite more, more, more permanent. Than, uh, but they considered like this this uh, swinging bow to be an art installation. The, it came from Australia, I believe, and was brought in for the holiday season here. 
Um, yeah, and so there was music and lights associated with moving on the swing. It's kind of cool. Not permanent, unfortunately. Right. But we'll see right. what comes next. Right. I also want to point out that this site is where I remember most, but maybe available elsewhere. Um, this um, this area had multiple um, places to charge phones. There was Wi-Fi available. Um, it was it was welcoming that way, and um, we were told that people um, during the pandemic have come out and and worked here. You know, as outdoor space. Um, just a, a couple concluding uh, observations, and, and uh, well, here it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't know that was it was going to show on here. Um, you know, it, it, it's clear that the business community through the Downtown Detroit Partnership and other other means are very committed and active uh, financially and otherwise to the success of these downtown parks and open spaces. Uh, they, uh, Detroit has really uh, knitted together uh, a cooperative uh, arrangement with the city, the DDA, um, et cetera. And you, you, you look for comparables and, and hope that in Ann Arbor over, over the coming uh, months and years that uh, we, we can begin to share a vision uh, that all will want to participate in. And uh, it's, pretty clear that uh, um, this is working well in Detroit. Uh, this, this partnership really um, is well honed and, and, and uh, well organized. And uh, they really touch on all the essential services that uh, this kind of endeavor would, would need. So uh, we, I, we will continue to be in touch with Detroit. Uh, David Cowan is uh, interested. He has family out in Ann Arbor. He'd like to come and uh, and walk our, our site and, and uh, share his ideas on the ground with us about uh, what, how we might proceed forward. Frank, I'll hop in just for a short yeah. comment about uh, another important partner that we need to look at is parks. Uh, yeah. And De mm -hmm. Detroit does work with their parks uh, mm -hmm. department too. Right. And, and we need to make sure that we, that is, you know, that we are not that we're at least accounting for the major participants in. Yeah, thank, thank you for catching that, absolutely. Um, just a quick, a quick update. We are uh, going to be meeting by Zoom with uh, Paul Sincock, who's city manager for the city of Plymouth, a week from today. Um, Rita and I have had a preliminary conversation with him um, earlier in the fall. And uh, that's a very different organization, much smaller community, uh, a real focus on uh, Kellogg Park in, in their downtown area. Um, and the city manager, uh, is Mr. Dehoney still on? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> their, uh, their whole effort uh, to, to manage uh, Kellogg uh, Park and uh, events that spill out into the downtown are, are uh, handled right out of the city manager's office. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, getting to know Paul Sincock, you'll find that this, this gentleman really thrives on events. He, he likes to call Plymouth uh, Disneyland North uh, because of all the events that uh, happened there uh, during the year. So uh, th this will be, a, uh, I think, a useful ex experience and interchange, but very different from what we've had. And uh, we, we also would like to, at some point uh, down the road in the near future, uh, talk to uh, uh, Mr. Dehoney uh, about his experiences uh, as city manager in cities like Cincinnati and, and other locations and what he might uh, bring from his experience experiences there to uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. So we look forward to that as well. Uh, Rita, could you, it, it would, I think it would actually be good if there are other uh, comments. Maybe. Perfect. Thank you. Um, any questions at all for Alice or Rita or Frank? I have my hand on. Jen? This, I think, uh, is more of a, a comment than a question, but I think 
the one thing that I think is is really maybe a model for us to consider about this particular example is that there aren't permanent structures and which we know is a huge hurdle and really an unlikely challenge for us to be able to overcome on this space. You know, we know that, you know, puncturing the roof of the parking garage and all these other things really causes a lot of um, strife versus um, having a pop up, having these sorts of things. It allows the flexibility, it invites some sort of creativity and almost a community involvement in it. Um, which I think sort of bridges the, we want a park, we want a commons, we want et cetera, to, to kind of blend in a really um, more authentic way and organic way than what we've considered in the past. So I, I love this example because I just, I, I think that, you know, when we look at businesses, community, nonprofits, et cetera, you know, it, it just has a whole flavor of um, inclusiveness that some of the other ideas from either a budget standpoint or, um a utility standpoint have have really lacked so this this to me seems like an exciting comparable for us to consider thank you other questions at all question of how the uh, programming is actually organized on in these various uh, uh, places how do community groups get access to do it? And uh, who does the calendaring? What's the sort of on site management process? Is that something? Alan, almost all of that is, um, is through the Detroit, Downtown Detroit Partnership. They have a staff of about 20 or 30 people who organize hundreds of events and hundreds of groups. Um, put who need need to use the spaces so that's the answer they have staff and they have money through the downtown uh, the business department whatever their name is <laughs> downtown detroit partnership i think thank you in, in plymouth uh it, again it's uh it's so, it seems like a quite an organized process through the city manager's office where uh they're capable of sitting down with an organization who wants to have an event and they work out a budget and the cost uh, and the city uh, attempts, I think, with a good degree of success to, to help support the maintenance and ongoing uh, operation of the parks through uh, the uh, sponsorship fees for, for events. I, I don't know the details, but uh, it, it seemed like there was quite a well-established process uh, in Plymouth through the city of manager's office. Well, we had with an earlier city manager, Mr. Dahoney, you should know, there was a request to the initiating committee, the library green conservancy, the, uh, the community activists, could you take on the calendaring and that responsibility because it was too much of a hassle within the city administrator's office? Or if there was more going on than just was handled by the occasional projects through the community services, what would, could the community itself take on that management? And it does not seem that either in uh, Plymouth or Detroit uh, that has been done. I was wondering also in terms of other communities whether any look will be taken to uh, Stratford in Ontario uh, which had a similar uh, kind of parking lot that turned into a very vital location and also uh, uh, Cummins, Indiana, uh, Columbus, Indiana where the Cummins Corporation sort of maybe in the same form as maybe Kellogg functioned in uh, Plymouth, uh, gave a big impetus to the community development there. So are there other cities that you are looking on beyond the Plymouth and Detroit, both of which, and thank you very much, it's a great presentation. So I really appreciate what you dug up, but are you still digging out there? <laughs> we are. We're going to be digging for a little while, Alan, for sure. And I, I know you mentioned uh, Stratford, I think, in the December meeting. 
And I did look up uh, some uh, information there as well. Um, and I, I, we are gonna be digging for a while with a few more options. This was just the first. Uh, I'd like to just point out a couple of things as well that um, with respect to the things that we saw in those spaces, um, the chairs were very often freestanding. Anybody could move them around and the tables um, and they were just out. Um, we asked about the potential for um, those things disappearing and they said they lose maybe two chairs a year. Um, they do have staff who um, put, sort of patrol the area. Um, they have eyes on the park, um, but it really had a very relaxed feeling that was um, was very comfortable. R Rita or Frank or Alice, do you want to just touch on on how they handle? Uh, I think they do have a really neat way they interact with the community members there that doesn't feel like a law enforcement based uh, feels right. very open. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? I thought that was a very important characteristic. Yes, it's a. I think it's. From one of my understanding of the budget, which is incomplete, it's it's a major part of their budget that they hire people from the community to be part of their ambassador group. And um, the, I, do, I haven't seen a printed job description, but th these are people who are uh, eyes on the park. They're there to engage with people in the park. If, if uh, for example, if I show up and I want to know where. <laughs> And Grand River is uh, they'll you know they'll help direct someone from out of town, um, but uh, they're they're the first level of uh, I, I wouldn't use the the term security I'm not sure what the right term is if 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 something is just beginning to become a problem uh, they I think are trained to uh, observe and maybe uh, engage a bit but if they sense something's really getting out of control then they'll ask. Uh, for more help um, but uh, they're also kind of have a i will say a kind of a custodial function and uh we we met uh, a couple uh, of these employees and uh it, it had a very very easy feeling to it um these people are obviously uh well trained and and understand their role and uh it's it's a it's it's a major uh force of yeah, people they, to cover these parks uh, that they, they have. had pride sorry for interrupting frank but they no, definitely right. had pride of of their job and their place um one of them in particular said i just love this particular park and it was in uh, grand circus being on on adams street i think it is or adams Ad avenue it was really um it was really nice to see the way this group of people interacted all of them yeah, and I'll, I'll add that they sort of acted like a mobile kiosk system. They were they had uh, <laughs> had carts that had uh, um, clean up things mm -hmm. and also um, information of, about resources, whether it was uh, social needs or um, tourist needs or whatever. And they just reminded me. I mean, I just harken back just now to going to Greece, and you went to the kiosk for everything. You know <laughs> everything, and it was kind of like that. Um, they knew they knew the usual people, and they they could help the the visitors as well. And they had printed material, and they had the ability to communicate with other uh, forces like the police or um, whoever needed to. You know, even I'm sure they are prepared for uh, health emergencies as well, but at least to call in for help. So. It was, it was a very, it felt like there was a friend in need, you know, there was a friend indeed in, in that, uh, in, at every turn. And, and they were quite, quite um, identifiable as well with yellow vests and their little carts with full of some kind of helpful stuff. What is the pay scale? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. We talked about ambassadors in the commons. It seems like a good idea. And lo local people with their eyes open. Yeah, well, it might take might take two instead of two hundred. But. Member Briggs has her hand up. Who else does? Sorry. Council Member Briggs. Oh yeah, Erica, please. Um, yeah, Erica, you're muted. Yeah. Try again. <laughs> 
thank you so much for that uh, for the presentation. I think it was really interesting to hear about, more about the, this partnership and kind of how it's playing out across different parks and um, also the additional information about the sort of the ambassadors that are working. I think that's an interesting piece that might be able to, we might want to dig into a little bit more just to um, explore the idea of the masters um, downtown in general. I think that might be a, an interesting idea to carry forward. Um, I was just observing that it's, um, if we are getting to the tail end of this conversation, um, it's eight o'clock and I know we already approved the agenda, um, but I was wondering if there might be like general um, willingness to move agenda item eight before seven, just so we have a full discussion of the RFI process, because I felt like that might be longer and I feel like that might be, we just want to make sure we get the full conversation there since we're trying to end by nine. If that was amenable, if folks were amenable to that. I think that'd be a great idea if folks are comfortable with it. Yep. Okay. Um, any questions at all before we wrap up on 7A and then we'll, we'll jump forward. I would like to mention that um, uh, the ambassador program that brings up, brings to mind the need we have for something like that in helping to resolve the issues around Liberty Plaza. And uh, I think that's, that's a, a very tight thread right there between those between the difficult issues we have and the way those kinds of issues have been resolved in other places. Absolutely. I have made some communication with the School of Social Work, whether it is feasible to have a, uh, a intern uh, uh, assigned in the, on the commons, somebody with a little training to keep their eyes open about what are problems. A field placement. No, no answer is that yet. It requires a local organization that wants to do the supervisor. Well, I, uh, any other final questions for Alice or Rita or Frank? Jeff has his hand up. Oh, uh, sorry. Who does Jeff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I just I didn't want, I don't really so much have a, a question as to I want to strongly uh, support Jennifer's perspective on modularity and temporary structures and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, there's a lot of creative things can, that can be done with that, and that's the direction that it's the future. And you know, the world changes a lot and, and needs there are multiple needs in our community and and having a a uh, flexible and modular approach to, to, to organizing this uh, will be, be very responsive to that. And then the technologies exist to do some terrific things with that. All right. Well, unless there's uh, anything else, we will uh, jump ahead per Councilman Briggs' suggestion. Um, and then, Heather, do you want to present the RFI? Um, and I know you've been collecting feedback, so. Yeah, and I'll bring that up in just a second and I'll do some live editing of that, but just to help everybody remember, because I know that my brain needs to be refreshed, you know, what happened at the last meeting, it just seems so long ago, a lifetime ago. Um, but what we talked about with the edits last time was not just emphasizing the library lot, but talk about all the public spaces in there. So that's one change that I made. Um, organizing the project goals into categories so you can see that I did that. Um, add other transportation options such as tunnels or even skyways. So that's mentioned in there. Include a mention of the gardens. Um, talk a little bit of the, the function of a civic center. So there's a brief statement in there and we can look over that and talk about that a little bit more. Add some language about having a sustainable legacy. So that's been included. And again, I'll, we'll go through this in detail, but I just kind of want to give the review of the feedback that you provided last time and the changes that I did make. Um, one request that I did not make was add information about street conversions because that's not set yet. There is talk about converting um, fifth and division to two-way streets, um, but that's not definite. There's going to be a study that will be happening in 2024, but if there are any changes, that's not going to happen until 2026. And again, that's not definite. So I don't want to put anything um, about that in there until we really know the direction of it. Um, 
There was another request about putting language in there about potentially moving the elevator enclosure and the ramps. And the feedback that I received is there's not really room to move those around. That that causes a big, big whole thing under underground that it would be very, very, very costly, very difficult um, to move any of those features around. So as it stands right now, um, people do not want to entertain moving those features. Um, I add more there was another request about adding more detail about we what we know about water and electricity. I actually don't have all the detail about Liberty Plaza and some of the other areas. Um, and I would say in this, since this is an RFI, we're requesting information. We don't really need to go into that level of detail about where every single water spigot is and, you know, and electricity, electrical outlet. So uh, that's my opinion that we don't necessarily need that in there. Um, we had a request about adding more info about Kemp House and Liberty Plaza, and I did include that. Um, add more uh, groups to the people that we are um, wanting to reach out to. So I included the Ride, Housing Commission, Treeline, Main Street Association, State Street Association, Carytown, um, and Equitable Ann Arbor Land Trust. And then I did have a question about deadline. That's not in there yet, but I would imagine that this would be on the streets for about a month that would give um, places time to really think through this and work it into the workload to respond to it. But we can talk through that if you want a shorter time or longer time. I see um, Alice's hand is up if you want to jump in there before, while I'm bringing up the actual document. Yeah, uh, a couple of things. Real quick, if I could just ask Heather, uh, could you explain, uh, because we have Council Member Dish here, uh, exactly why you went with the RFI and kind of where we're at in the process. Yes, yes, I can definitely go over that. So uh, what we're looking to do, and you might recall that council had um, authorized $40,000 to do a design process for the site. Um, originally, we had talked about doing an RFP, a request for a proposal, but because we don't have all the funding in place, we thought that, and we meaning staff, thought that it would be better to do a request for information because that's less cumbersome on consulting firms to put something like that together. And that would give us the information that we need to put together a robust, um, more detailed RFP. So what we're looking for generally with this RFI is a process that they would propose um, and what general costs would be. Not going into detail hour by hour, you know, how much it would cost, but generally what, what would the process cost in their mind. So that way we can put a request out there or know how much funding we really, we really need for this. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Um, am I on? Did you say, okay. Um, oh, yeah. A uh, couple of things. I almost lost my train of thought as you described all that stuff, but ooh, are we still on? Yeah. Um, the uh, people did not want to entertain the idea of using the structure that is there. Uh, that doesn't, people who people. And um, also, I mean, that kind of rankles with me uh, because um, I know for a fact that there are speculative structures within the overall structure that are intended to be used for something. And I think we need to count those as assets for repurposing, if nothing else, uh, such as the elevator, which was also speculative uh, to serve a much taller building uh, by reconstructing that in that location, perhaps. But uh, these are not fixed ideas at this point um, and never were, uh, like the cutouts in the foundations and so forth, and the foundation itself, which is reinforced in a certain area. I think those things could be quite determining in a very exciting new creative repurposing of those existing structures without increasing costs or um, ruining warranties or anything like that. So, and I'd, I'd also like to keep in mind there's a, um, a time period for the debt structure to be removed. So, you know, a lot of these things that we're avoiding are really not worth avoiding. We want to make sure that, you know, for instance, if we decided to build a permanent structure, we'd want to kind of consider what's there to build on. Uh, so I, I, I didn't like the idea that people don't want to entertain changes to the structure because 
they did when they built it. And that'll I'll end with that. It's, it's not um, not entertaining changes to the entire structure. The, um, you know, for example, the breakaway panels that which you've talked about. Um, the, that's something that we can maybe work with, which might provide walkways or tunnels or something like that. It's just moving the elevator shaft and moving the ramps. That is viewed, and by they I mean the DTA, DDA in the city um, who own the structure, um, don't feel like those can be moved. Well, still, they built it for that very, that very, in that very way. I mean, and they complained about not being able to use that those things, but we're not talking about removing them, we're talking about repurposing them. Um, well, I don't know about repurposing that. That's not how I framed the question. I, I asked the question of whether the ramps could be moved and the elevator shaft could be moved. And okay. I was told no. And then Frank, I see your hand is up. Yes, uh, I would just like to second Alice's point. I. I think we want to have as quote unquote clean a sheet as, of paper as possible to imagine what the possibilities are here. And my impression was that that central exit and en entrance area, um, and maybe even the positioning of the elevator, but, but I'm just focusing on the, the ramp that uh, leads down and leads up uh, for people going in and out of the structure. Um, I don't. I I think it's. Uh, I don't know if the word is premature to rule out any any adjustment of that uh, entrance area, which, which I think was primarily to serve uh, the high rise that that hasn't uh, hasn't come about. So I it I just w uh, wish that the city could be a little more open and imaginative. It may be at the end of the day nothing will change, but unless we have more flexibility on what the possibilities might be, uh, we may be uh, closing ourselves off from some exciting opportunities down the road. Rita? Um, okay. Um, well, and it, since we're on that topic, the, um, the way I see the ramp is like, can we even just close it off? We don't have to necessarily move it, um, but maybe right. there's a way to temporarily um, cover it over. Um, or use it as access for storage or something. Um, our experience in Detroit showed that they needed storage for many of those things that they place in and out of, of the area. So um, I think that I'm saying something in support of flexibility. Thanks, Member Briggs. Thanks. Um, it sounds like there's some debate around this. It seems like um, this might be something that might, you know, be more important for the next phase of the project too. Like this is the RFI that's going out. I don't know if we need to get incredibly detailed about this site in to that degree. I mean, I think this can, those issues can still be explored even in the next phase once we understand exactly how much how much this process of engagement is really going to I'm design gonna it's gonna be would be my suggestion. And then the one piece that I um, I noticed that you didn't include, but I was um, thought maybe there was a reason you didn't, um, or maybe it was just um, uh, just, you know, slipped off the, the notes page, kind of creating a, um, a limit, like a, a dollar figure, uh, a proposed dollar figure. I noticed that wasn't within the document. And I was wondering if there was a reason that that wasn't included in here or if there was a way to, you know, if you had any additional thoughts about that, Heather. Oh, um, yeah, I apologize when we talked about that last time. And and you request, or you or anybody else requested putting in a dollar limit. My thinking was that we wanted to find what people thought this would cost, you know, and that would help us with an RFP. But if we want to put a limitation to it, then, you know, we can certainly do that. I personally would, I think we could end up with um, really grand proposals about engagement process around this. And I would be at least interested to find out, you know, what what you know? What type of pro projects proposals could we get for eighty to one hundred thousand dollars? And then you know maybe maybe a category above you know what what's not included in that? What could you do for more than that? You know what would what are you cutting out in that process? Or is you know is feedback you know are we are we shooting too low when we suggest something like that? So no, I'll just add in. Uh, 
couple of points here as well, uh, if I can. I think I do think that uh, some type of uh, you know range around the uh, cost is probably helpful. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know we certainly do not want something that uh, comes back that we really fall in love with that is uh, you know out of the realm of reasonable. Um, but uh, so I think some type of range maybe that that allows for um for some um for some more grandiose visioning um you know that doesn't cap us too much but but also gives any vendors looking at the uh the uh rfi uh, you know a somewhat of a degree of what we're looking at so what is the range that you would propose well, of, course, <laughs> of course you're gonna ask that question i don't know the answer to that um you know, I, you know, I, uh, honestly, I, my, I, I would be able to, uh, I would throw out a number that completely could be completely off, Heather. I, you have probably way more expertise not to throw it back on you, but, um, on this than I do. I mean, I, I think we were talking, you know, we originally said 70, I don't know how, um, how, um, you know, uh, solid of a number that is. And then I think we have gone up to say, maybe realistically that's too low and, and we'll be over a hundred. But I think the top we had sort of really talked about was like 140 um, and thought that, that, and that does feel a little ambitious to me even. So maybe somewhere that's the high end. Uh, and, but I, I'm throwing out numbers. I, they're not necessarily educated. Um, and, you know, I, I heard, I did want to just chime in too on the previous topic. Um, you know, I do feel like the blank canvas is really important. Um, you know, uh, in the, uh, you know, either in the RFI or, or the RFP process. Um, I know that when I've uh, looked at doing things where we have to really test, uh, test the limits of things, you know, if we, if we artificially limit ourselves to a degree too much, then, then we can really, um, we really take some uh, potentially neat ideas off the table. Not to say that, that, uh, you know, the structure would be altered for sure, or that we even decide we want to go down that route, but certainly limiting ourselves from the start, I think is uh, not really a good way to go about it. So and I guess that sort of vision is what I have around this range too. Uh, yeah, and I would, I would say, so yeah, the pushback is the, the idea of like altering, you know, what's below the surface and how that would be really make a lot of changes and how expensive that would be to change to the parking structure. And that there's not the thinking, at least this is the feedback that I received, is that there's just not enough room to move those things around. Um, so I, I, my feeling is if, if it really cannot be moved or we're not willing to move it, um, then, you know, I don't want to go down that route of designing with that in mind. That being said, I guess I'll put it to Mr. Dahoney and sorry to put you on the spot, but maybe you can, um, you know, kind of ask, you know, the DDA and have conversations internally about what we are willing to do. So maybe we can come back to this group next time with a definitive answer like yes or no, maybe maybe we can think about moving it. Um, because I, the last thing I want to do is put out an RFI or an RFP and say we, we can do something and then ultimately we can't. Like I don't want us to go through, you know, several hundreds of thousands of dollars of doing a design process um only to get a design in the end that we're we can't do or we're not willing to do I, I do. <laughs> the language the language we're using is getting more and more confusing because i thought this was an rfi and are we talking about the cost of putting out the rfi no the, it's not going to cost to put the sentence? rfi out Right. And uh, it'll ultimately be an RFP. So an RFI will feed into, you know, what we get back, the information will feed right. into an RFP. So, so uh, we're, and I think there is someone in the room, so to speak, who uh, I think I'm almost quoting, that we don't want to uh, de define our projects or our uh, improvements by what we can get or what, what we think we can spend. Uh, we need to define them by our values. And um, I also, you, you also said you're getting feedback. Who are you getting feedback from so that we understand why we can't, uh, can't leave off the limits? It's interesting to me if we're doing, if we're requesting 
information to actually get information that would help us define the project, uh, the, the scope of the design work that we want to take. We're not asking these people to design something. No. But, but we're also not telling them what we want. So I, I think this is a conundrum at this point, and we need to really resolve this. And then I, I don't have the answer myself at this point. So. But yeah, one way is that we just don't even include the language about the ramps and the elevator shaft and then RFI because it's again, you know, we're only asking them for a design process, like what they would propose. So I don't know if we need to really continue worrying about this too much, you know, for the RFI, we can continue to investigate um, the people that I talk to are the DDA staff and city staff. Um, you know, again, if Mr. Dahoney might want to pursue this a little bit more and, and come back and see if there is wiggle room right now, what I received back is there's not wiggle room. Um, so um, I, I just received a note that Mr. Dahoney needs to step away for a moment, um, but I can talk, I can carry this on with him a little bit further later on to see if we can get more definition around that. But well, that, I, that's just I, what I, heard that, so. I, I, will, I, I do want to say that I was impressed with uh, the report of, of something that Mr. Dahoney said. It was that we don't want to just um, buy what we can get. We want to know what we want and see how we can get it. I'm, sure. it, I'm paraphrasing, and, and I think that's a, a really uh, solid premise upon which to proceed. Sure, but we also need to put out the parameters, and I see Mr. Dahoney's hand is up, so please go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Is this better? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, the, the comments that I would make are we shouldn't let um, processes and procedures come before consensus around vision. We, we have not really said what we want and maybe we don't know what we want and maybe there's a difference of opinion on what we want. But my experience in other places is we, you have better results if you begin with a consensus around a vision of what you're trying to create. And so the conversation around the built environment and move this ramp, move that door, you know, drill a hole, don't drill a hole, should be secondary to a clearly coordinated vision around at the end of it, we want this to be a place that does X number of things. It's a gathering place. It is a place that provides resources, it's a place that provides activities, it is a place that is programmed, it's a place that offers cultural offerings. Knowing or having a deeper sense of what would be acceptable in terms of the activity level and um, you know, I'll share a brief example. Uh, when we started developing the Cincinnati waterfront, it was 18 acres of dirt. And we determined that we wanted it to become a 24-7 environment that had a residential component, that had a nightlife to it, that had a pad for a corporate tower that um, had a park at the waterfront and a streetscape that connected the stadiums from where the Bengals and the Reds play ball. When we started, we had nothing. But once the vision was clear as to what we wanted it to be, the processes that we implemented were all meant and designed to help execute the vision that had been decided. 
And so um, asking a design firm to provide information is certainly appropriate, but I do believe we need to get to a point somewhere down the road where we can clearly articulate what we want the center of the city to be. And in my short few months here, uh, I've heard differing versions from different people about what that is. And, you know, that's fine, but at some point we've got to coalesce around, here's where we're trying to go. So what are the mechanisms that will enable us to get there? And when we do processes and the price tag provides sticker shock, then we start to either value engineer or adjust the vision to what we believe we can reasonably afford. In cities where you see uh, ambassadors or people that are in orange shirts or some kind of color who are out there uh, connecting with the public, um, I've had those in multiple cities and they are paid for through the implementation of a bid, a business improvement district. So it's the property owners that have agreed to pay a little more in order to have the ambassadors out there so that you don't have to have a saturation of police officers out there. And so it factors into um, signage and lighting and activities and a lot of communication amongst stakeholders so everyone is aware of what's coming and a very, very strong volunteer component. Even if you have staff, the cities that do it well have a strong volunteer component to help to implement the activities that they put on. So whether it's festivals or concerts or whatever, uh, Ann Arbor is a lean organization, DDA is a lean organization. We don't have the infra internal infrastructure that other places do. So we're gonna to have to supplement that with whether it's volunteers from the community at large, from the university, from wherever, in order to pull off, uh, if in fact we are trying to strive for something that is a lot of activity, a lot of day, daytime activity and nighttime activity, um, or a service-oriented environment where people who need help can come and hopefully find it. And so I, you can do a lot of things, but the pieces do need to connect. So if you want 24 seven nightlife, that's not the same kind of place where people go to seek services. It's just a very different dynamic that can't mesh. So I'll stop talking. Um, I hope that made some sense. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I would say that this process, at least how I've been thinking about it, it, you know, we kind of got so far with the center of the city task force, which was meant to put forward a vision for what was wanted in the space and that this would be carrying that on along with putting actually a physical design to that vision so that this is meant to be um you know a process that gets at all of that um you know we could scale it back and say we just really need a vision you know we need a process as step one to get consensus on a vision since we're not quite there yet and then we could go to step two and then say you know then put out and RFP for a design process for the physical manifestation of that vision, basically. Uh, Rita, and then Jeff, and Camilla, and then Alan. Rita, you're up. Thanks. Um, I feel like the kinds of things that we're talking about right now um, point to the need to be in touch with what we've been calling the block partners. Um, it just feels key to have input from them on this phase of, of our planning. And so 
that's my plea. You know, it, it, I feel like in some ways you've you've done some of that with connecting connecting with the DDA and with staff, Heather. Um, but it's a start, and we know we have a, a number of them. So I, maybe maybe uh, maybe that's where the RFI will take us to connect with those those groups. Um, but I feel like it's a missing part of the puzzle. Yeah, again, that's how I've been envisioning it. You know, we have the list of people. Like to me, right. the, the important thing is the process of this. Is you know, there would be um, all these people would be engaged. I mean, it would be a large mm -hmm. public engagement, and you know, and that's that's part of the vision. Like we need the community involved in what the vision is. Um, again, we got you know to a certain point with the center of the city task force. There was a lot of engagement with that and we have some things that rose to the surface which are listed in here um, but as far as like a cohesive vision statement maybe we're just not there yet um, in terms of like we want you know to be specific enough saying we want i don't know chairs and dining i mean i guess we do have that in there we want a play area so i i mean i you know i guess maybe we need to make a decision about like how 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 uh how much of a fine of a point on this do we want before we put an RFP out or if we're comfortable with that being part of the process, like creating that vision. So I think I had Jeff and then Camilla and then Alan and then Frank. Oh, yeah, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Mr. Honey, for your, your views. I, uh, I am very much uh, in agreement that we've got to have a vision to drive excitement and interest. And I've been saying that for a long time. Um, what I'd be interested in hearing from you is whether you think uh, what some cities have done across the country and across the world is uh, organize like competitions with prizes, with financial prizes for the community to propose or to suggest ideas um, for a center of the city and, and, and the city civic center commons, whether competition of that kind uh, with a, a juried competition would would uh, would sort of generate a lot more support and a lot a uh, lot of uh, engagement that that may not be there right now. It kind of puts together the top down and the bottom up approach. I feel it's a little bit top down right now. I know we need to do do it that way up to a point because it's you know we did the task force and. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get, you know, lots of individual views, uh, you know, through surveys and stuff like that. But I've noticed that several cities have have put those competitions out there and gotten some exciting ideas and results and a lot of commitment from from the community as a result. I was wondering if you had had some experience with that and what you thought of that. I have certainly uh, seen and been a part of uh, some competitions um, that have prizes attached to them to uh, generate creativity from the community. And so uh, it can be as uh, granular as, you know, here is a parcel of the footprint and what do you envision can go here it can involve naming things it can involve uh, creating a theme for the area uh, i think activities like that uh, help with one transparency but also developing the groundswell of support that is essential uh, for the in project to be successful you want the community to buy in and feel like regardless of where they live i have a stake in what happens in the center of the city i have an opportunity to participate in helping to make that happen and so a competition that has uh prizes typically cash prizes will bring out T tends to bring out different kinds and different levels of participation. For example, you may have 
a group of students from Eastern Michigan that want to participate in a competition that has a prize attached to it. You may have students from elsewhere or even uh, if, if the prize is attractive enough, you may generate all kinds of participation. But it does take an effort to run those. You do have to have a source to generate you know, the prize and you do have to be clear on what are you asking people to submit. Camilla? Hi. Um, so it feels like we're describing our dilemma as uh, who came first, the chicken or the egg. Do we do visioning first or do we start the RFI and RFP process? And I just want to say that we've been visioning for years now and frankly with only a small percentage of the population. And publishing an RFI doesn't mean that we're done with visioning with the community. A, a key part of bringing in consultants is um, that consultants can lead community engagement workshops and visioning workshops with a broader um, set of um, residents. So I'm in the camp to you know, finalize this RFI and, and soon publish the RFP. Um, I have less experience with RFIs than other people on the call, but I think it looks great. So thank you, Heather, and, and other staff members for writing this. Um, it's never going to be perfect. So, so let's just put this out and see what happens. Frank? Um, actually, since our last meeting, uh, Rita and I and, and others uh, on the committee and in the community have been kind of wrestling with questions very much in line with what we're wrestling with now. And we've already touched on one, uh, or probably more than one, but uh, this engagement with the, the block partners, I, I think, is absolutely crucial. If uh, and, and maybe it's a function of the of the you know the consultants uh, but uh, I, I question whether you're going to get longer term uh, robust engagement uh, and it should be started now uh, to, to really get these black partners focused on on this issue and uh, I, I feel that they, they need to be integrated into this planning effort and the design effort uh, if, if this is going to have ultimately have success in the longer term, because it, we need their participation and buy-in and support. And it just seems like uh, we need to get started now. Uh, uh, and it may actually uh, enhance the, 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 the professionally uh, organized uh, study with the consultant. And it seems like, uh, Liberty Plaza might be kind of the, the lightning rod here. Uh, I think the block partners have a, a, a strong uh, interest in, in seeing uh, a redesign and a, a, a reimagining of Liberty Plaza, which can spread out over the entire uh, public land on, on the block. Um, I'm under the impression <clears throat> there's a lot of data in the uh, appendices of the task force report there are uh, some key early reports. Uh, I've been, I haven't looked at, but I've been told the 2013 Parks Ad, uh, Advisory Downtown Subcommittee uh, report is important to look at for, for data. So I wonder if there's existing material that could be looked at now and, uh, and understood at a, a better level than we now have that understanding. Uh, in anticipation of the of the consultants coming in, there's this issue of really engaging with the DDA, and we need to be we the council needs to be a direct part of this, and understanding uh, the engineering uh, limitations, uh, the structural limitations, and and uh, possibilities more more on the possibility side uh, of what what can happen above that structure, um, and it seems appropriate to ask the DDA to shoulder that uh, and get that study going. Um, I don't know whether some 
visioning can take place before we get to the RFP, but it seems like in a preliminary way, at least, we, we the council would benefit from profes some professionally facilitated working sessions that would perhaps draw on some of this information uh, from previous studies uh, and uh, have this council and, and maybe it could be an expanded council plus, I don't know, uh, that could begin to do, do some visioning um, rather soon in, you know, multiple sessions. Um, anyhow, that, those are some thoughts that have occurred to us in, in, in conversation with uh, other members of this board, the Library Green board and, and donors, and uh, just uh, people in the community who are interested in the, these ideas seem to be surfacing. And I'm, uh, I, I think we offer these, Rita and I, <clears throat> as a way to kind of move the process forward and, and, and uh, ensure we get the most beneficial uh, studies uh, that we'll pay for, uh, you know, for professional consultants. Um, we want to be sure that uh, we expend those funds in the, in the most uh, thoughtful and intelligent way possible. So those are just some, some thoughts uh, I have about what we might be doing in, in the shorter term in preparation for uh, the RFP. So real, real quick here, I'd just like to jump in real quick. So we're not talking about an RFP tonight. Right, right. We're talking about an RFI. And I do, I want to second what I think Camilla was getting at here, which yeah. is, you know, to the, the comment that you made about sort of professional facilitation, Frank, I actually think there's pretty broad agreement on the fact that that does need to happen. Um, but that would come, as I understand it, uh, and I'm going to lean on Heather in particular because she's a professional designer, uh, to, to help us I mean, to, to back that up, I mean, this is part, the, the items that are listed in this RFI, the, the groups that have to be engaged with, of which the top one is the Council of the Commons, um, you know, should be part of that, that visioning. And uh, so, uh, as I see it, what you're suggesting um, is going to be taken care of as part of a, a professional process that is, that is responded to by a potentially interested uh, design firm here. Um, and so I do think it is very important that we have a professional facilitator and professional uh, group that, that guides this process. But frankly, that is exactly what we're doing, in my opinion, by going out for bid for, or not going out for bid, going out for a request for information. Um, I, I don't know, Heather, can you speak to, maybe there's some confusion as to what we're trying to get at here. With, yeah, there's some yeah. yeah, I think there is confusion because I, I think we all are, everybody's saying that they want the same thing. And um, yes, Adam, I completely agree with the way you stated it and the way Camilla stated it, that this, that is the process. That's what we're asking for is to refine the vision and then put, put it on paper. You know, what does this physically look like? Because that is just something that we don't have yet. Um, you know, we, we just kind of need that. And, and it needs to be a public process because this is such a meaningful space for the community. So I would, I would hesitate for, you know, this group just to kind of do their own visioning or for us to do some sort of preliminary visioning stuff with select groups or select people and rather just put it out to a consultant, to a, you know, a professional team um, to begin this process and for it to have a consistent cadence to it, a rhythm, and, um, you know, that it's all building towards this ultimate kind of vision design, you know, vision statement and a vision design for the physical changes to the space. Well, that's, that's reassuring. Thank you. Um, Alan, you've had your hand up. Yes. Uh, I, uh, our moving to this question is what postponed uh, uh, item uh, 7B on the agenda, which was looking at our relation with the block partners and our immediate outreach, uh, which we will get to next meeting. And that is very important. And I concur with uh, Frank that uh, somehow quite apart from this, uh, request for inform further information is just harvesting the data that we have and the uh, 
getting some evaluation from the city or the contractor uh, as to the structural limitations of the place or its structural capacities or what is needed to adapt. Uh, I put in the uh, amendments to the thing, to the uh, draft, decide, <coughs> uh, uh, look for uh, an inspired design or alternative designs. That uh, I'm very interested if it were possible that the uh, uh, center ramp to the parking structure be uh, decommissioned. That I think it was sense that it is, was for the building. It's not going to be built there. And maybe it is not necessary. And the parking could, as a parking lot, underground parking lot, function perfectly well with the entrance on Fifth Avenue and the exit on Division Street. We should at least have some evaluation of that or attention to that as is that at all feasible in terms of how everyone analyzes parking structures and so on. I've assumed that it's not feasible. I've been interested in as a principle in the vision that we're maximizing people's space and subordinating automobile space. So I've been interested in a uh, a terrace uh, balcony over those uh, uh, ramps and the down down area that would increase people's space considerably and it could extend over library lane and that we need a, a, a connection between Liberty Plaza and the library lane uh, parking lot and that has to have either a bridge over uh, uh, the Martin property or through the Martin property. And I think the efforts that Stefan Trendoff did to draw some of these alternatives is really as close as we have come to some vision of maximum utilization, including a sense of some civic center building, which is at least engineeringly fe feasible over Library Lane, that that should be part of the exploration and uh, having a sense of a uh, indoor outdoor capacity and functions as would be in some sort of civic center building maybe that is subordinated or transferred to the library or to the martin company but at least in the design there should be the exploration of a civic center building over library lane not to minimize not to reduce the sun area that could be for people, but to make use of maximum use of the area that we have in this public space. And similarly, the vision includes some sense of a relationship with the Martin uh, uh, property in terms of how we interface with Liberty Plaza and the library lane lot and a potential inclusion of the Noble House and the uh, carriage house into the overall commons uh, uh, design. So all that is part of the vision and that should be what a what is explored in this request for more information, what details more do we need? And those were elements that I put into my uh, list of um, amendments or improvements of the uh, RFI and I don't know at 12, 848, whether we're going to get to any of those, you know, uh, numerous things with all these hands still up. So okay, everybody wants to talk, how good. <laughs> so, so real quick, I'm just going to make a, su a su suggestion here because I do think, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to start with the premise that it's, I, I really do think it's going to be difficult for this group. We've been at this for now a few months and, I do think it is going to be difficult for us to move forward without some professional um, professionals who who do this for a living guiding this process, and uh, so I do want to. I think that there are Alan, as you referenced, you've submitted some am amendments. I have one as well, um, but I think it it is in our best interest for all the reasons that folks have stated up to this point tonight to move forward with an RFI. We're not expending dollars. Um, we are not choosing a proposal. 
Um, but we are asking for information from professionals who have, uh, frankly, far more knowledge about this than I do, at least. And uh, I'm willing to bet, you know, most folks here too. And I, I feel like we're going to tread water for a long time and go nowhere unless we, unless we engage some professionals. And so, um, you know, I, I would, if it's, if it's okay with folks, I, you know, obviously you can go beyond nine o'clock, but I would like to, to uh, take us back to amending the document so that we can give Heather some direction um, and, uh, and uh, then moving forward with, a propo with this uh, RFI, establishing a time frame, you know, and, uh, and moving forward with it so that we can really answer the questions. It does no harm to us by doing this. Can we go back to amendments that folks Sound would like to Sorry, Alan, go ahead. I just said your internet unstable, your sound disappeared. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to ask, can we go back to amendments that folks would like to make to, to the RFI? Maybe, I don't know if that's better if Heather pulls it up or not. Um, I have one, um, but I, I can go first if that's fine. Heather, I think you had suggested this, or maybe Council Member Briggs had suggested this earlier. Um, regarding the site details, I would just like to strike the, the uh, bullet point that talks about um, the elevator enclosure uh, and ramp to the underground levels of the structure, which must stay in place. If we can just take that out. I think it's best to be silent on it. Um, and uh, that's really the only change that I have. I'd like to reinforce uh, that amendment or second it or whatever <laughs> in, in that that would resolve some of the discussion as to what can and cannot be done when we don't know yet. Um, so um, I'll third that. <laughs> and the in the uh, the parking structure was originally designed to support a building. Eh, well, I actually, I actually, Alice, I thought about that one too, to be honest with you, but I, I actually think that's a good piece of information because there is, that speaks to the structural nature of the parking structure. Um, and I don't think that limits us at all. Okay. I think Erica has something to say. Yeah, um, I do, but I don't. I don't want to jump in line. <laughs> I do have a specific amendment I wanted to suggest. Um, I do. I agree. I'd like to get this out. Um, I, if you could scroll up, Heather. Um, there's one that jumps out at me. I don't. Maybe it, it may be useful to vote on some of these rather than like discuss them at length. Um, so I'm fine if there's not general agreement with this. Sorry, I should have told you to stop. <laughs> Scroll back down. I'm not, not paying any attention. Um, project goals. Um, the second bullet point where it says create and enhance multimodal transportation connections. I know you were asked last time to add things in here. Um, to me, this is the second bullet point in our design, and it doesn't it doesn't resonate to me as like what came out of the center of the city design process. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that one of the pieces that's important is just creating and enhancing connections to from and within the block. And if we just kept it simpler right now, and instead of kind of creating visions of tunnels and skyways, and it, it, it may end up very grand or it may end up with, you know, simple design connections between the process, but if there would be support in just simplifying that bullet point to creating and enhancing multimodal or non-motorized transportation connections to from and within the block, um, would there be support for um, simplifying that bullet point? I'm good with simplifying it. I think it's a broader vision and better for this point in the process. Yes, I, I agree. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, and then, because I love to argue with myself, essentially, if um, I will leave it up to you, Heather. Um, if you feel like it is limiting to put a dollar amount on this right now, you know, I'm I'm not going to feel strongly. I'm just pragmatic, and I don't want to end up with like a, you know, a proposal for. Her. I don't know that it's limiting. You know, it's yeah. it's kind of right that balance which we're trying to meet with this between the pragmatic and you know, like let's see what we can do with this. Um, you know, realistically, you know, how much is the city willing to spend on a process? 
Um, <laughs> so I, I don't think that's a bad thing to put a, a limit on it. But I also do kind of wonder if maybe that does make us want to jump to an RFP. And this is just me kind of thinking out loud. Because originally I thought, you know, one of the purposes of doing an RFI um, versus an RFP was to get a better sense of what the cost was. Um, but if we're going to, you know, kind of already just put our cards out there and say we're willing to do a design process up to a certain point, then. Uh, Heather, I, I think that uh, that's the, you just it articulated whether you meant to or not, why we should not put a dollar amount on there. That's what these professionals who look, who put the RFI together, they will figure out how much is, how much it's there to work with and how much it's going to take to do whatever they, they're, they're the ones that know the numbers uh, of what they're talk, going to be analyzing. They'll, they'll figure that out because they know something about it. Uh, that's what, that's what I think. And therefore, you know, I'm, while I didn't disagree with Erica. I'm, I'm fine with it being removed. If it's, if that's a, a key point, point of information we can get out of the RFI process. If there's a way to slightly refine it to, you know, you know, provide some tiered cost. I don't know. <laughs> so so no, we can, yeah. Do you want me to leave it at that? Ask for tiers. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a that's actually a great way of threading the needle. I think to what Eric. Yes, because the professionals will know what they're talking about if, if they're any good. Well, this is Ann Arbor. We only get the best, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, I will, I will refer to what Mr. Dehoney implied, is we don't want to buy what we can get. We want to tell them what we want to buy. I know that uh, I, I know there are a number of folks with their hands up. I think Sarah has had her hand up the longest. Uh, yeah. And I something. keep changing what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, Sarah. Oh, so now that we're talking through amendments, um, I guess this is, I don't know if this is a specifically an amendment, and I think I'm still a little bit confused on like what an RFI is, but this project goals section, I guess I'm confused what exactly we're asking them to submit. I think I'm, I think I'm clear, but then we get to the project goal section and everything we've been talking, you know, the design and inspired design, we're not actually asking them to give us a design though, right? I'm, I'm just wondering if like this project goals, are these our project goal? Like, it's just, it's a little unclear to me, like what, do we need to be more clear, I guess, in the RFI, like what we want these firms to be submitting? Because we don't want them to give us an inspired design. That is just, I don't know. Right. Yeah, but, you know, then right, like, the, like, like, the engagement part, like in that design section or in that whatever project mm -hmm. goal section too, like, you know, th there's that process, like a design process. These are sort of like our, these are the things that we want, I guess, like a potential, like full proposal to include maybe but this this well, little piece like confuses me i guess just like how it's in there and i wouldn't want it to confuse I, design firms that are i think that under the category of design i think we should strike out that um I, go back down to the next page so uh, we're at, at design you shouldn't even use the word design there is is what i'm thinking it, it's too confusing what design of what um, yeah, I, it, and if this is, if we're not asked, if we're just providing these project goals as sort of like background, if like this is stuff that like sort of has come out of like all of these other endeavors, like maybe there just needs to be a few sentences under project goals that sort of says like, these are things that we've gathered through other processes that might help you, you know, in proposing a design process. Because I don't think we're asking no, them is, to like, Yeah, and maybe I'll just put in a clarifying sentence, you know, this all of that is under the background section and maybe that just needs to be made a little bit more clear well, um, that word right there design under project goals uh, is sure key. well that 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 was there because i was asked to put it in these under categories and i could take that out i think these categories I, out I, I um, think the, the project her, goal is to uh, an inspired design, and this request for information is to contribute to an RFP that will do that. Right. Yeah. So here's the instructions at the bottom. This is what we're asking of the consultants. I wonder if that should be bumped up. I, I could know. do that. I mean, this is following up template that we have. Okay. Um, well, but, maybe it can just be like copy, like it can be there, but I, I don't know, like, as I'm reading through this, I'm like, why are we telling them all of these? Yeah, like, it's just to give background. Things? Yeah, I, I think yeah. 
the, the, the idea behind maybe the maybe design is not the right word here, but I, I do think when you know if you look at the 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 uh, categories that Heather chose, you know she's very very clearly um, you know speaking to like physical items, you know trying to to build that vision. Uh, so Please the, stop. And and then the process, and so and then implementation, and so I, I don't know if design is the right word, but I think it's you know it's it's clearly trying to differentiate like you know, these are the elements of the things uh, of the RFI that we're asking. Maybe if we, ch would it, I don't know if it would help to change design to program. Well, I think we actually are. I mean, we are out of the, our goal for this ultimately in the RFP is to get a design, right? I mean, we do want to design at the end of that process. I think one of the pieces I'm wondering if we're missing is we actually need to refine our vision a little bit to create this design. But, um, yeah, I think program actually actually goes more in that direction than design does. Design is like a result. We want a program, a method is what we want, you know. Um, well, I think we've got, a, we've got that in process. I almost think we it's like a it's a it's like a, a vision or a, or maybe not a vision, uh, a layout or or elements of uh, physical elements. It might be a better. Um, I mean. Mm. I don't know. That, yeah, that doesn't we really work like this for Call like days program. and days, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, like, yeah. we could wordsmith this forever. I just think, like, if, if we just had like a few sentences before it even says design, like, it just says project goals, and then there's all these categories. I don't know, just something to describe. I don't know. This, there's so much in this background before you actually get to like what we want them to submit. Like, I was sort of getting lost. And the way that some right. of this stuff is worded, it's almost like we're asking them to do these things, but we're not. If that makes sense. Well, I, to, have, I, to have something that has so many bullet <laughs> points is a little bit. R real quick, I, I do think so. A couple things. I uh, one, um, let's let's go back to the hands here so that we can not drive Heather too crazy with jumping around. Um, but but uh, I, I think it just I I think actually Sarah's suggestion is probably a really good way to resolve this because. You know, at some point we are going to have, ask for an RFP. We're not doing that now, um, but that RFP will be around a design. And so, so putting some vision in the heads of the of potential design firms who could submit to that RFP around what we're trying to get at by by this bucket of bullet points here is actually not a bad idea. Um, that does help them really think about what they're what they're looking at. Um, you know, potentially for a future RFP. And uh, so I, I think Sarah's suggestion actually maybe is a good way to resolve this. And what was my suggestion? Just like add a few sen clarifying sentences yeah. on like what clarifying, these things are. Clarifying Please, introductory sentences. What is the suggestion? Right here, Alan, it's going right up on the screen. Okay, that's all I had, I'll take my hand down. <laughs> But I, I agree that I think we should just get this out there and like the sooner the better. So whatever it takes for us to do this, like, you know, without having to rehash this at the next meeting, let's do it. Thank you, can sir. You just, can yeah. you just end it with background information? I mean, that that's probably enough right there. I mean, the other thing is, is that, you know, just speaking to the point that we probably don't necessarily need all this detail in here. Um, mm. I think it is like if I were reading this, like I, I'd like that in the background information. But if if it is confusing, if you're reading it and thinking it's confusing, like we can take all of this out and just have these bullet points, like an inspired design, you know, like a community supported design I might not I, I, process. So I actually really, I mean, I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of thought that goes into the elements here. And at least in my opinion, they do help sort of paint, you know, they help create ideas. And, you know, I just, as, uh, so I, I'm actually not so sure I like the idea of taking them all out, frankly. Okay. Um, I don't want them taken out. I want them improved. <laughs> I, I, I think at this point, we, we're not going to conclude this discussion tonight. I put forward a number of, of uh, proposals to go through and there's just more time. I think we should consider the question, what is that clarifying sentence and come back to this 
in an intermediate meeting or at the next meeting that I want to have the proposals that I made about uh, uh, four season building and uh, connections between Liberty Plaza and so on and, and library lot and so on uh, included or specifically said no. But I think they should all be included. If you say, well, include everything, all my little suggestions, that was fine. Then I'll say pass it all. But uh, so, I, I Alan, real, real quick. Suggestions <clears throat> that I made to be included. Yep, understood, Alan. So why don't we actually pull up the, because uh, <clears throat> you did make a number of suggestions. Let's pull those up and, and take a look at them and just make sure they're addressed. Because I do think it is important that we get through this, even if we stick around a little bit more tonight. And that way we can get it out in the field. We're going to have a window of time afterwards, and it would definitely be nice to get a response to this thing. So let's 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 power through if folks are okay with it, and take a look at Alan's suggestions. If uh, if uh, if uh, Heather can put them up there, I don't have them, and uh, I'd neatly type them out so somebody can put them up, and I can go through what what each one is. Thank you, Heather. Mm -hmm. So first I made some suggestion in the history. Um, in the first paragraph that the inclusion of the liberty of the specific elements is not really listed in the uh, charter and should be put into parentheses. In the next paragraph, giving the history for the dec for decades, this uh, question, uh, yes, came for, but it came to a head, not with the prospect of misuse development, but with the putting forward of a, a request for, for proposals. That's when it came to a head when there was actually different questions on the table. It had been a long-standing question, and so I would re reverse the uh, uh, the group interested in uh, multi-use, and, uh, and on the other hand, the group interested in the park in the other order. The primary, the first interest was in replacing the lost Central Square when the courthouse was torn down in the 50s. That was a long-term interest, unsatisfied. It recurred in every one of the uh, uh, working groups uh, that uh, looked at this. Only <laughs> the multi building only came forward when it when the RFP came out, and then there was an actual proposal. Alan, and, let's let's just split the apple on this and just take this sentence out. Um, and that and way, it, it seems the story is a good story. And I, just do it, do it a little more accurately. It's not controversial, but I'm just saying in facts. Okay. Well, I, I think it would be it would be in everybody's best interest to try and uh, because it's actually uh, uh, less relevant to the RFI itself. Okay. Uh, you know, I think it would be in everybody's best interest to focus. Uh, I, I want to get to the points in your suggestion okay, I, here. That I, I appreciate that. We can cut it all out. Okay, let's. We'll just work at cutting that out, and then. Um, I, do, I do think we need a nice little history in that form that is accurate. We don't have to debate it now. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So we'll work on uh, amending that sentence that that takes out the portion uh, that uh, that is the coming to a head, um, and then. Uh, let's keep going down. Uh, Maybe the, you just take out that paragraph. Uh, well, I think we want to have the, we'll work, yeah, we'll work that out. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Uh, let's, let's keep going then. Um, uh, and I had, uh, oh, here we are. Yeah, I'll just note that that's language from the task force report. Um, so that's where that came from. But you want me to take that just to be clear, because I'm not sure what we're removing. Yeah, I would say what just I, number yep. one history of the fourth line. Where are we? Uh, so I, I let's let. How about this? Uh, so Heather, let's just take out the came to a head 
with the, uh, in the second paragraph, uh, came to have with the prospect of misuse development on library lot site. Maybe just uh, uh, questions remain about the future of the city's, uh, the block's city owned land. And then we'll just take out the next sentence. In the recent years, the question came to a head with the prospect. Uh, just take out that sentence. Call it good. And maybe that. Take out everything about ultimately this led to proposal A. Yeah, all right, that's fine. Yeah. We'll, we'll strike a, a balance of this section. Okay. I think, Alan, if, it, if it's okay with you, uh, we can work this this wording out in the history okay, section. Okay. Well, let's, get, put, let's get to the action. Put it my ear and work it out with me. Everybody has agreed. Absolutely. I don't think there's any difference there. So let's, let's go to the actual elements that deal with the, the RFI elements so we make sure we capture that others may have opinions on here. Um, I think that starts with the project goals. Is that right? Item two? Project goals, yes. So I would suggest that looking for information that we might have alternative design design an op an inspired design or alternative designs okay. just leave it, leave it be open because there is one there is one design that has been floating around and i don't know why nobody does says that's the best design but there must be an alternative design that people have in mind rather than the one that stefan drew off so what Stefan drew out is certainly going to be one of the designs considered, and maybe there's another one. I don't know what it is. Nobody has shown me a picture of it. How about, how about I, I don't think it's speaking to, you know, I think it's uh, speaking to the, the point between behind an inspired design is speaking to uh, a vision that, that this RFI process would, would uh, submit to. We could say, you know, inspired designs, if we want to say plural, um, you know, that there's nothing wrong with that, uh, I don't think. Okay, and I, I'm strong for the engineering realities. Okay, so why don't we just change that to inspired designs? Are you fine with grounded in engineering realities? No. Okay, all right, keep going then. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know what you're asking them to do is, is when you when you talk about um, engineering realities, are you ex telling them to uh, rein us in, or are you talking? You know, no, they, I think they, they should know what the engineering realities are when they do the design. If the design, if the design is like Grand Circus Park, to put on ten feet of dirt, then that requires a reinforcement of the existing roof. Uh, and some recognition of what that might cause. So yep. uh, people say there are limitations of what we can do. Well, exceeding the limitation, if the vision says, well, we want more tree, then what is that gonna cost? And some, they could figure that, figure that out as to looking at the engineering drawings, how much can that roof structure support? And if we wanna put more weight on it, in a diverse way rather than on the pillar posts, uh, what would that require? Yeah, so I, I, I think let's just leave that language in if folks are comfortable with it. I do think it, it doesn't limit us, but it does speak to, you know, a, um, a pragmatism. Um, okay, if, the next one is, very, is, is the one I'm most uh, concerned about is to one of the things it should include is a four season indoor outdoor civic center building or the functions of such as well as outdoor central park function okay so that was discussed the last time around and i thought that it was uh, put in there that something about civic center indoor functions. and so i offer some uh, simple language Okay. I would, um, yeah, I'd like to weigh in on that. I mean, I would I'd be hesitant to say that this, the final design design should definitely include that. I don't mind the, the, you know, the idea that we might be exploring that within the design process, you know, as, as an element, but I want to be careful about suggesting that the final design is going to have a civic center building. Cause I think that is a, that's a, that maybe should come out of the design process and in the engagement of the, the block partners and the community. 
Well, it's an open question, but uh, it does seem that there are four season functions, likely in a civic center building. It may be that these four season functions will defer, will be absorbed in a building in public space that the Martins create or in a reconfiguration of the new library or in a new building. Uh, and it could be also the inclusion in terms of uh, some social service, the inclusion of the Noble House in some deal with the Martin Company that they're quite open to, from my understanding. So all those sorts of things are part of the potential design. Could, could we could we add in some language to, that speaks to what Erica was getting at, which is you know could include, um, and uh, because I I am in the same spot, I'm not so sure that that anybody's decided this is definitely going to be there, but could include this, um, and then I feel like that's the same way with the second item you got there. Could include a water fountain feature. Um, Would that just be like in that second bullet under design when all of these things are detailed out like the, that proposes ways for the city of centered city to do I don't know how we would say it but it's like those are they're like all considerations that we've talked about I'm, I'm really confused why we're being so specific on this because we're not asking this RFI we're asking them to design a process to do this later we're not asking that like these should just be sort of like broad examples at this point I just don't think we need to like get down to this level of detail in this specific RFI. And to give you the background, the detail that was included are the top things that came out of the center of the city task force process. So the, the things that came out of that were the seating and tables, an active play area, water feature, if feasible, you know, so that's why those things were listed there. Yeah. You know, because yeah. Those, those are things that, that people sense. generally, we seem to have general agreement in the community about those things. I could yeah, have a line that, that says, yeah, potentially include a year-round civic center building. I mean, I could add that in there, but that's yeah. that's why those other items are in there, just so people understand the background. I hope I can just interject that. Um, um, oh, lost my train of thought. Never mind. Uh, Heather, I think the language you just utilized, I think that's a fair compromise with what Alan had suggested, could include a potential year-round civic center building. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. What's wrong with that? Uh, could you scroll down a little bit into the process area? Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, meaningful to maximum feasible here. Uh, I use that maximum underscore. I was in the war on poverty. Maximum feasible participation is a term to reinforce not critical what is the, what does that mean alan what does maximum feasible mean to you participation. it means as close to everyone as you can get yeah i don't support the inclusion of that language um not because i don't want to see that alan but i do know that what's going to cause you know what is going community engagement is what is going to um those are the costs that are going to drive up this proposal and we obviously can't have everybody in the community um well we don't know what we can have but the ideal should at least be to maintain when we talk about community engagement at least maintain a standard that the war on poverty put forward and having worked in that that's a language that i would say would be normally part of such a thing meaningful you can say meaningful and then we can say well that's Anyhow, you don't want it, you don't want it, okay. Uh, I wanted to put in, in terms of the phasing, a recognition of 2024 as the Ann Arbor Bicentennial and in the staging of however they see this unfolding over time, that is a focal point. If there's a building to be built or a bridge to be made or something, something in that process should culminate it on that timeline. I think we should have that as part of our recognition of what we are dealing with. Is that a problem? Yep. I'm good with that. Oh. About the DDA, uh, site, site details, 
mentioned as a DDA district, yes. It's also a midtown a character district. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but looking over all the districts of town, this is in a sort of, mid, there's a midtown character to it. And as long as we're identifying districts, I think it may be that language would be useful. That's why I included that. Alan, real quick, uh, do you, uh, you know, the midtown character, the DDA is a defined area. Um, the, you know, I, adding a midtown character district is not something that currently exists. And so, uh, at least to my knowledge, um, I'm not so sure we need to add that in. Okay. I, saw, I saw it in the plan. In the okay. Area. Maybe I missed that. Is that actually in there, Heather? In the task force report? No. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know that people would know that it would what that would mean. Um, I'm not sure what the Midtown Character District is myself, to be honest, unless you're talking about the yeah, zoning district. I, I read in looking at the DDA districts, I read something the districts of Ann Arbor. Oh, I see. Yeah, I don't know that the, I don't know that a consultant, you know, like it would, it would make them do legwork to understand what that even means. So I don't know that it would be helpful. And there was a midtown district which is sort of in this area where we are bridging a number of different neighborhoods. And then there was moving down pack with another district. It's not important, okay? I wanted to include uh, as the uh, relevant participants there, the credit union, and the Intercooperative Council, uh, Jerusalem Garden, the Noble House and Carriage House's historic buildings, and note the, that there are other specific buildings on the music and the apartment houses. And the, space, uh, the space also includes Library Lane and the ramps, whatever we do with them. And whenever we are speaking, usually the, the it spoke of the library lot and we have been uh, cautioned or desire to speak of it as the library lane lot. So I wish that language would just be corrected. And then I added two other sections. There was a section on the uh, Liberty Plaza and the different parts I added library lane to look at the walkability and landscaping of that is a pretty dry, and to look at the potential of an elevated terrace, and to look at the potential of a civic center construction building. And those are potentials. I wish they would be looked at. And then I added another section of potential connections. Uh, and how we would actually interface with the first Martin building and with the library building existing or future and to project across the street to the new housing on the Y lot and the Blake bus terminal. Uh, from the new library, there could be a second, uh, a bridge over the avenue. Anyhow, that is part of design. Stefan had some view of that in his drawings. Ellen, we don't actually have jurisdiction over that, though. You know, I, I mean, well, the, jurisdiction. We're trying to envision design. You know, we how do we interface with our neighbors there, and what is the potential the, and difficulties of closing the west end of Library Lane for large events, which is what was it was designed. But now there is a uh, convenience of the bus company that goes through there. And so that can't be done. Uh, but that is something that we should request information about. And, so, so real quick, on uh, just looking at this um, library lane subsection here, yeah. you know, I, I guess I'm just going to ask you, you know, when it comes to the library lot, or library lane lot, I'm fine with getting the language corrected here. Um, you know, are, is there any reason um, why we just can't include the library lane 
in uh, you know library lot and library lane or library lane lot and library lane and then just take care of having to create another section and um because because uh, library lane is, is a it does is a street and these are both uh, elements that look at how can we build over that street to increase people's space and subordinate the automobile which is an implicit principle you know we want this as much for people and as little for the cars yeah i tend to think we're you know i, I appreciate all the extra effort you put in on this alan I'm, I'm a little worried that we're i think heather's done i think we're we have the potential of overloading this 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 document a little bit and um, I think Heather's done a nice job of trying to integrate what we've said at the last meeting um, but I think it, it gives folks a pretty good sense of what the space is and, and what we're what you know we're really trying to get to the design process and there's a lot that's going to come after this but I don't you know I, I, I tend to think it looks pretty good right now. I know at the last meeting I brought up a recognition of a potential civic center building and I didn't see it here. So I'm making it explicit. Yeah, I, 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 and I think a question that we need to have a helper help us look at is the connection between Liberty Plaza and the library lane lot. And that intersects with the first Martin company and that recognition that we got to get into what are the options the commercial arcade through the Martin company that they seemed interested in when it first was presented but that hasn't been reinforced is a pretty interesting idea and whatever our information people should be looking at and if you look at that it seems like those things are appropriate in what we're looking for information otherwise they'll come to us and say so what are we looking at with these people why don't we put out maximum information of what we offer yep alan so i'm gonna just make a, a quick suggestion here i i'll i think we should just take your your library lane section here and i think we just put it in i don't see any harm in doing that it is part of the block um and then i do think you know adding a point because we have talked a lot about the importance of connecting liberty plaza and uh and the other parcels maybe adding a point i'm not sure where it goes best maybe it goes under the block uh section around the connection points you know at you know the desires to connect the, the elements together um i think I would, I would caution if if you're saying take this whole library lane section you know the potential for an elevated terrace over the ramps and bridge connection between liberty plaza and library lane lot and the potential for a civic center building construction over part of li library lane. I don't know, that just feels pretty prescriptive. That, that's, but, that's a fair point. Why don't we just take the first the first section and, you know, get it in and be a little broader. Is there any objection to that? Okay, so Heather, if you could put in just the library lane subsection and then that first line, and then add a add a point in the block subsection around connecting the parcels together. Um, so you know the description of the different areas, the public spaces on the on the lane are just our descriptions. Um, That's a fair point. Yeah, so that's that just gives background. I just don't have, you know, there wasn't a lot of information that I had about library lane. You know, I, I could say that it's a public lane, I guess, you know, in the description area, but I can put, you know, in the design section or for changing that to program section. Yep, I think that makes sense. You know? Why do that? Yeah, that makes, I think I go, I know where you're getting, you're, you'll add a connection point into the design section. And then just enumerate that the library lane is one of the parcels mm -hmm. under the site details. That sounds good.
Yeah. Just uh, suggest that you note that uh, Library Lane is not a public road. It's a private street. And that's that only a classification in terms of engineering. So if, if they're looking at um, the width of the street, it's under, under the usual size of. I think as long as it's called out as a feature, uh, given that we're just talking about site details, that's probably fine. I think, I think the point that Alan getting at and just enumerating that it does exist there, actually, that does make sense to me. And it's called out in the, as a feature in the uh, first paragraph, the last line of the first paragraph. It is. Library Lane parking structure in Library Lane. It is, yep. And there is a view, you may not share it, and it's, it may need a type professional dickering with, but the Library Lane airspace is potential people space that should be developed and can be developed as part of the commons. How it is done requires some inspiration. Some of it might be a building, some of it might be a deck, some of it might be the Western opening to the new Martin building. It will improve the quality of their space. But that is all potential in this and somebody who is looking at the, a design process and a design vision should know where things are at. Now, if there are any other ideas that should be put in, you know, that's what we want to stimulate a potential bidder for this you know, to actually be thinking about what's going on. I, I feel like we've crossed way past RFI and into almost RFP territory. This, yeah. this, feels so, awfully, this feels so prescriptive and so, yes. we've, so we've gone off of what this purpose is, in my opinion, and I, I mean no offense, it just, I feel like we've gone way beyond what we should in this document and for its intended purpose, well, as to what I understood the intended purpose to be. So, so real quick, if we get, Heather, if you could pull up the document just and take a look at the changes that we're making here, I do think that you know, pulling pulling up Alan's list, you can certainly get that impression, Jim. But I don't actually think that that's what we're we're adding in here. Um, yeah, I haven't added a whole, whole lot to it. So I, I mean, I'm just kind of keeping notes at the end right now. Um, okay. So adding recognizing 2024, the Ann Arbor Bicentennial um, Library Lane lot, not or library, yeah, not library lot. So changing that. And then I did add, um, you know, something towards the end of design, improve walkability and landscaping along library lane. So that's what I have so far, but I, I mean, I, I do, <laughs> I know what Jennifer is saying, cause I, I do feel like if we just kind of, like this could go on forever where we're like including detail after detail after detail. <laughs> And yep. then adding, you know, like these partners, like kind of along this partner. This is just supposed to be like a sampling of people. Yeah. Um, you know, like I don't know that we want to just keep adding to this. Again, this is just supposed to give people consultants a a sense of, you know, the history, the background, what we're generally looking for to come up with a very general process. Again, we're not asking them for a proposal, but just kind of a give it help them get a sense of what a process would be to help us do a design. So I, I think that, I mean, Alan, uh, given what uh, Heather just listed off, I mean, um, you know, it, it obviously does not correct all the wording that you had asked about, but it, I think it does speak to a lot of the elements that you had asked to include. All right. Well, well, if somebody comes forward to, uh, you know, bid on this, uh, I obviously have no opportunity to tell them what was left out of this that they should know about. Absolutely. I've sort of wasted my time in looking through this and how to make a better document that is more instructive to a potential bidder who might give us information that we need. I would like in the list of organizations, uh, the uh, in initiating committee to be identified, as I said, as recognized by the city council as a uh, on the ground uh, partner in this development and i provided some text for that and i wish there'd be a reference to the city council resolution that recognized the initiating committee and our community commons initiating committee uh 
I mean, I have no problem. I may talk too much of this, and it's on, on to 9.30, which is, uh, you know, an abuse of... Uh, and yep. so, so I'm satisfied with whatever is put out there, and whoever bids on it, I'll have plenty of opportunity to say what I think is relevant, presuming that it's not, we're not going into the closet, but they will actually deal with these people. Yep, that sounds good. Critical in terms of who okay. you would want to engage in uh, seeking uh, to advise us. Anyhow, okay, I've said my piece, although I'm not here. Okay, so uh, are there uh, are there any um, are there any other amendments for the RFI? I would like to ask if uh, companion references are expected to be a re expected to be available to the responders to the RFI, such as the task force report, which I think includes a lot of the things that Alan is, you know, looking for. Uh, it, it it this is really I, I'm with Jen. This is really kind of ballooned into very detailed and somewhat prescriptive, uh, you know, you must include every, you know, all of these things, including engineering realities. You know, it's just, it, it's their, it's their profession. It's their, and the, to, to be informed. And if we give them some of the major documents, uh, they'll go from there and everybody wants to make it their own. So the respondents will try to make it unique uh, in their interpretation. I, I just think we're going way beyond. They're, they'll stop reading. Who's going to want to respond to this? So, so I, I do think, though, that, uh, you know, I mean, just respectfully to the original draft, I actually don't think we've added very much to this tonight. Um, okay. In terms of, you know, we made some maybe key changes that folks wanted to see, but I don't know that we've added a lot of material here. Um, you know, I th is there a reference, uh, Heather, to the yeah, center of the city report? There it is right there. So, I, I mean, I think that point is pretty well. Pretty that's, well the, that's the task force. So do they, have, do they have access to it? Yep, they should. should be a public okay. document right there. I don't, I don't know why you uh, wouldn't just list the, the access to these reports if they. This is a link. Yeah, it's linked right here in the blue. Yeah, I, but I, I mean, just just eliminate all that verbiage and, and let them you know, look at it. I, well, never mind. I, whatever you want to do. Any other, any other points? Yep. I just want to um, add one small thing that um, as far as like the, the groups to be consulted, if we could just like leave that sort of open-ended um, because there are others, you know, um, so instead of, you know, we have this whole very specific list but there are a few others, and I'll spare us a listing of what I've thought of. But, you know, let's leave the like, door open. Like such as? Do you want me to? Yeah, such as. Yeah, such as would expand it a little. Perfect. Um, well, the statement here, it says it is critical for this effort to have an equitable engagement approach that is highly inclusive of members of our community that have historically had limited participation in decision making processes. Keeping this in mind as a central tenet to and top priority of the engagement process, the engagement process must also include the following interested and affected parties. So it's, you know, it's not limiting. It's, it's just like originally this was just meant to list, you know, kind of the partners that we saw and it ended up expanding a little bit further than that. Right. So the first paragraph to me sort of speaks to people who might be more casual users. And I'm thinking of like the Liberty Plaza, people who use Liberty Plaza. I feel like they're described in that first paragraph. And then there are the other more established groups. Um, so I hope that the engagement will in include um, regular users of Liberty Plaza in some way. Um, but let's leave the door open. That's what I want to say. Yeah, I, I almost think that uh, your description, Rita, is actually covered in that first sentence, though. Um, you know, that when we reference uh, highly inclusive members of the 
community that have been historically had limited participation in city decision making process. I mean, if you want to add in user, including current users. No, uh, and, and no, I'm thinking that that is inclusive of that. So, but I'm thinking, so there are still others, you know, so I'll just say one. The Martin Building includes the Center for Continuing Education of Women, you know, so that's another kind of block partner. So there is, so let's just leave the door open. Okay. So, um, and, and maybe that's just including it, start the list, including maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Heather, go back up to that last sentence on that first part. There you go. Right and here. Such as such including at least the following interested and affected parties include must include at least the following interested. Thanks. Yep. No problem. Any other, any other points? Okay. Alice, do you do you are you raising your hand? Oh, not at this time, and I won't get to. I'll, I I'd like to say something at the end, I guess, for next agenda. Definitely. So, do we need to vote on this to put out the RFI? Should I put a motion forward? Yeah, I think we should. I do. I do. Do you want to put a deadline on what the R when the R we want the respondent back? Um, I will leave that up. I'd like Heather maybe to suggest, suggest when that's an appropriate date would be. Um, well, probably a month after it goes out is what I would suggest, to, just to give consultants plenty of time to respond. That sounds good to me. I move that. I'm good with that too. Are we uh, developing a list of consultants to contact? Or are we putting it out generally? What are we doing? It goes out generally. We have a, a board that our, all of our um, um, RFPs, you know, things like this go out on. And I can send you a link to that if that's helpful so you can see what that looks like. Sounds good. Uh, Heather, I, or not Heather, uh, Erica, did you make a motion then officially? Yes. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, second. Okay, uh, there's motion on the floor to put forward the RFI, um, you know, uh, with a few of the history wording changes and the suggestions that Heather uh, looked at. If there's folks are okay with it, Heather and I can talk offline, make sure that gets done. And then, but the motion is to put it out after that's done. Um, and uh, it's been seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Sounds good, it goes out. Thank you. Um, thank, you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, it, if, if it is okay with folks, uh, can we table uh, the items in, item, in uh, agenda item seven to the next meeting? We're gonna come up, they're gonna come up again anyways. And so uh, that way we can, we can advance into um, uh, any next agenda items. I think you had wanted to voice something there, uh, Alice, in the public comment. Yeah, I I do have. When you say table, do you mean put it on the next agenda? Is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The items uh, in agenda item seven should be on every uh, meeting agenda. Certainly, and in that respect, I wanted to mention a couple of things we might think about for the next agenda is whether it's whether the timing is right or not to consider expanding the members of this commission. To include the major block partners like the Ann Arbor District Library, the um, I have them listed, DDA, Parks. You know, have somebody on on uh, from those three at least. Have somebody so have them on there. We have we even have two people from two different org organizations. Do we need two people from these organizations? We could make room for including a few of the major institutional block, block partners, which we really need to engage with um, because we don't get a chance to otherwise. Uh, so if we could have them be part of this process instead of being um, just bystanders, I think that would be better. Um, that's something to consider for the next agenda, whether we want to expand or redistribute um, our seats on this board. Um, I think that would also help engage the public and have them understand and be a broader 
be a way of broadcasting within the general. Um, and also that kind of applies to funding. Uh, more people will have different ideas about funding, uh, public funding and private funding as well. Um, so if we, um, if we look at that as not relying on those we know, but uh, relying on those everybody knows, you know, get more input in that. I think we should, that's where that, I'd like to consider the inclusion of these public entities, as well as maybe another, like, I don't know, I don't think we could get the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation to put somebody on this commission, but, but um, maybe somebody adjacent to that. It, we we kind of need to build our commission with more knowledge um, more broadly, I think. And so those are two things about engagement and, and money, <laughs> I think, that we can talk about within these items on item seven, but I would like to have them specifically called out, like expand, expansion of the board. We, it does It does allow us to do, our ordinance does allow for that, uh, to um, add more seats. Maybe it's time to do it. No, I mean, it, the resolution that created this, you know, prescribed um, the number and people that would be involved. Um, I think that- And the I bylaws. Think the bylaws that have been adopted by city council. Yeah, I don't think that's that. correct. Maybe I'd be glad to be corrected if I'm incorrect, but I, I believe it said foundation, you know, to be formed as such and that other seats not to be, not I to be exclusive of additional sure. seats. Sorry to interrupt Alice. I think Heather's correct, but I think, you know, we could certainly discuss this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it has to, because the bylaws that have been adopted and approved by council reinforces what was originally stated about who are the members and then the amount, the number of people that are on this board. Well, then we so should you, consider. It would be a recommendation that would go back to city council from this body. You as a body cannot change right. it. It would be recommended to city council and then city council. Okay, well, then we should consider the recommendation, I think. So that'd be one thing to put about. as a, as a sub point on in one of the, in the, uh, seven, maybe seven DE or something. Yep, we but I, I, I really think we should think about the impact we could have if we added more diverse seats. We can talk about Substituted. That's fine. Any other uh, final points for the next agenda before we move into public comment then? We could, we could, uh give consideration to when we expect our annual advice to the city council to be delivered or discussed. We have our, the one obligation we have is to advise the city council annually. We began meeting in May, we were formed earlier than that. When do we have to do this and how do we bring it about to be at what we would like it to be? We could talk about uh, the delivery on the, on the next agenda. Yep, absolutely. Put on the next agenda. Okay. Any other points? All right. In that case, let's move into public comment. Heather, do we have any members of the public here? Robert Black. Uh, book Thanks, Heather. And thank you all. You guys are amazing to listen to and to watch your process unfold. It is not easy. And uh, you've reached a good consensus tonight in passing the RFI, so congratulations. I think you're going to learn a lot by doing that, and things will come to you that you don't now see, and I'm really glad that you stepped into that space. So thank you for that. Um, I was looking back at my notes from April 1st, 2021, and much of those discussions from that meeting and the prior one and subsequent ones have been a lot about this same stuff you're talking about. Um, I would suggest you may have been able to save yourself some time by just <clears throat> referencing the work that was done before in the hundreds and hundreds of hours of the 12 people on the task force. Heather was there, Alan was there, and uh, many, 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 many public meetings. If you look at page, um, uh, page seven, let me just see here, of that task force, there's a vision. If you look at page 26, urban spaces preferences like balance of fountains, prominent sculpture, grassy and paved areas, prominent trees, these all came out of that task force. And they were done a long time ago, February 2020. 
If you look at page 27, you will find activities, preferences, survey, like sit and talk or read a book or have live music or eat, drink a drink at a cafe, uh, have public restroom. Those are all in there. And then if you want anything about physical um, sketches, look at Appendix D. Norm Tyler did some great work. Stefan Trendoff has some things. You already have a host of information in this task force that's gold for you. And I'm glad you're referencing it in the RFI because you'll see that, that the professionals are gonna bring that right back to you. So um, don't do any extra work that you don't have to do is my suggestion. And then um, if you wanna look up another example that I have given many times, uh, look at the Kaiser Center Roof Park in Oakland, California. Uh, Chad Monfreda, who's on the green team, and uh, used to work there and walk through that park every day. It, uh, it has a lot of the things that you want to do here on top of a four-story, five-story parking structure. So that's another example along with the other things that Alan mentioned and, and your um, you know, comparative communities outreach. And that's a powerful example you already have in front of you. Uh, model those behaviors and we'll be doing well to consolidate our efforts and work more successfully together. And I really want to echo Mr. Dehoney's um, comments, which are right on in my opinion. Know what you want. Say it right up front. Don't put the history up front in the RFI. Say what you want. I want an RFP to, I, to help us build toward an RFP and design ideas. Tell them exactly what you want when you want it and what are the deliverables you'd like to see not just the letter but maybe some other things it says i want to design or i want to process um, you already have you could edit heather's list into these physical elements and into the qualitative principles there's sort of two things and then approach or method or process is almost all you need for this and then just get a lot of the words out of there keep the link simple and then watch what happens you're going to be amazed so congratulations, good luck in the next meeting, and I'll enjoy watching you from here on out. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Any other members of the public, uh, Heather? There is not. Excellent, okay. Well, uh, is it possible we could get a motion for adjournment then? I move. I move. All right, moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Excellent, long meeting, but good. You all have a nice evening. We'll talk soon. I'm 52.